Okay, and we are live. Uh, this is my first hangout for a while. Um, I have not had anything to do with hangouts because Nathan is so fantastic. I've never had to deal with it. But um, obviously, things have moved on a little bit. And I had a hangout with a gent last week for um, the purposes of trying to do a physics paper. And the part of the deal was if I did the physics paper, um, I would then get the chance to go back and forth with him on a debate on scientific evidence or scientific proof to show the shape of the earth that we live on. The assertion, of course, being that we live on a spinning ball. Um, so if I could invite everybody to uh, the hangout and enjoy this uh, moment now. Um, Al, uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you so that people that are watching know where, where you are, what you are, who you are, a little bit about you. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm a science teacher. I've been teaching science for, oh, 2002, I think I trained. So what's that, 16 years? Um, I teach physics up to A-level. It wasn't my degree. Um, my degree was biology, biological sciences. I did a master's in that. Um, obviously, I believe that the Earth, you know, the standard model we're using is, is is what reality, you know, is the reality of the situation. Um, I'm getting interested in why people believe the opposite. And, you know, stuff like this, I think, is a really cracking tool because the kids can watch, you know, debates like this. They can listen to both sides. They can pick up a little bit of science, you know, and perhaps engage them to talk about it. And that's, you know, that's kind of my motivation for stuff like this. So how long have you been teaching? Uh, two, 2002, I started training. Okay. And with regards to Flat Earth, you had a back and forth with Dell. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, I'll tell you the history of how that came. One of the one of the kids, how this all started. One of the kids at my school um, came up to me with a video. Uh, it was it was Dell spraying a uh, football with water, and basically he was saying, "What's he trying to prove?" And I looked, and it were uh, it were an interesting video. Um, and at the time, I only had something like eighty subscribers on the YouTube channel. I'm still really really small, so I I did a little bit of a video, like having a bit of a friendly poke at Dell, a bit of a friendly roast. Um, for the kids at school, they had a bit of a laugh. They enjoyed it. Um, it found its way to Dell, and he called me out on live on his, one of his, his programs. He watched it, and he said, "Oh, you know, I wouldn't have uh, what it took to, to appear on his on his show. You know, I'd be a no show, etc." So I, I sent him some emails. We had a bit of back and forth, and uh, and I went on his show. And I'll be honest, it was a complete opposite of dealing with you. There were no, there was no no debate. You know, in fact, you know, in fact, those reasons that words, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to debate you. Um, he wouldn't let me finish a sentence. It were it were horrendous, you know, regardless of his belief. The, literally, the whole thing was it just descended into a farce. You know, what I mean, complete opposite to what I'm getting here. Um, and then you tried to, so go, into, you tried so to go into sheeps and neeps last night. Is that right? Yeah, well, I went into um, sheeps and neeps because he was talking about water not being made of oxygen and, and hydrogen. And he was saying that. He could prove that because the fish would breathe the oxygen, leaving only hydrogen left, and essentially all the water would disappear, and that's why water evaporates. That's that's what I caught from him. So I wanted to go and discuss that with him because um, that's clearly wrong. But a lot of the moderators on that channel remembered me from uh, Dell Show, and I think I think you saw it. I was you know I was just instantly banned. I was ultra polite to everybody, but uh, no, just banned straight away. Well, I'll vouch for you because I've spoke with you for a while, and um, like I say, we had that, you're the guy that gave me the hangout for the uh, the exam paper recently, and I thought, well, that's a really good trade for me because it, it just was, so it was a fair trade. So um, I'll vouch for you. If anybody thinks that you're a shill or some kind of operative or whatever, based on what I know so far, the guy's legit, and you should invite him because he's a teacher and he supports the ball earth, and he's the kind of person that we should be talking to. Because if there's anybody that we can influence in terms of like real world, in terms of the sciences or school, education, this is the guy or one of the guys that we should be dealing with. So don't be hating on this guy just because he blah, blah, blah. In invite the guy in because he wants to talk about Flat Earth and we need people like this. So don't be let let's not be bigoted. Let's not be uh, narrow minded. Let's invite, let's embrace this guy because we do need people like this to come into the discussion. Now... Um, we have had a back and forth, and the claim that um, I had with um, my compadre, if I minimise the screen, is that we don't we don't appear to live on a spinning ball. So the deal was that I would give him some back and forth, we'd give him five questions, and in response he would spend some time, he would give me a response back, 
and there would be a back and forth, but it would be controlled in a way that wasn't going to scare him off with unnecessary aggression, um, because that's not really a debate. So basically, we'll jump straight into it. Um, I'll start with the first assertion, which was basically, there is no scientific proof that we live on a spinning ball. And by scientific proof, I do mean following that scientific method. Um, I'm going to get instantly criticised for being indoctrinated by... Um, by John, but nonetheless, the point is true. The scientific method is really quite simple. Um, observe a phenomena, predict, make a prediction for the hypothesis, establish your independent and your dependent variable, um, and then prove the cause and effect relationship. Now, when I said that, um, these are all the buzzwords, was the phrase that came out of his mouth. So I'll pass it to you and you can deal with the first claim. There is no scientific proof that we live on a spinning ball. What have you got? Right. From all the questions we've looked at, this is the one where I'm probably going to waffle on for, for the longest. So um, you'll have to forgive me for that. I'll not be waffling on as much. I know that you say there's no scientific proof. And probably what I'm going to say is stuff you've heard a million times before. All right. I appreciate you've heard this loads of times. But the first place I'm obviously going to go to are the satellite pictures from space. I'm going to look at the ISS stream. I'm going to look at the footage from the moon landing. And to me, the battleground is there. All right. Um for the Earth not to be, not to be a globe, that all has to be a, a massive conspiracy. But if we look how deep that's got to go, with over seventy sort of space stations in the world, all launching satellites in, you know, into space from countries that don't get on, right? What what sort of unit is controlling all these countries that would love a bit of one-upmanship on each other to all stick to the same narrative? You know, why is one country out there not just saying, well, you know what, you know, let's let's break the silence and let's, you know, Korea, for example, they've got their own space agency. You know, why or, and Russia? Why are they not coming and, and 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 trying to disturb things by, you know, telling us all what's going on? And then we've got the private enterprises, your Richard Branson's, your Elon Musk's. Uh, you've got your astronomers, professional. Uh, astronomers and amateur astronomers, etc. Um, sweetheart, just don't come in here for a second, please. Sorry, I should have shut the door. I'm just going to shut the door. Give us one second. Sure. So, from the sort of conspiracy side of it, the battleground has to be that I have never, ever, ever heard one piece of evidence at all that that makes me believe there is a genuine conspiracy. I've heard people say, well, the, you know, the BBC would have this slant. You know, these people have got their own self-interest at heart, but I've never seen anything that would be um, a solid piece of evidence. I've never seen anybody on the deathbed making a, a claim about, you know, I know the world is flat. However, um, you know, I've kept it to myself and, and they're spilling the beans like perhaps other people. Um, but even moving forward from that, moving away from, you know, governments, uh, etc., it goes even further. I don't, and this is the thing I think, a lot of people don't realize how wide it spreads. So let's come down from the government. So let's just look at entertainment and the media. I've seen countless shows where people like, you know, Brian Cox, James May, to name two of my, my favorite uh, presenters, they've been up, you know, to the edge of space in planes. They've seen the curve, right? So how big does that go? The cameramen must be in on it. The presenters themselves, they must, must be in on it. I did a Google search before, and to be honest, I didn't write any of the names down, but literally, hundreds of presenters all over the world who've been up and seen the curvature of the earth. So, you know, in terms of the broadcasting, you know, how corrupt and how many thousands of people must be involved in that, if that's a, a cons you know, if the conspiracy is there. We move on to Sky TV and Sky TV engineers, you know, everywhere we go, we can look, all the satellites, uh, sky dishes are pointing to exactly the same places. So does the person who owns Sky, is he engineering, is he part of the conspiracy where he wants to point satellite dishes to make it look like they're pointing to a satellite because they're definitely pointing upwards, you know, not to a point on a, on, you know, on a mountain or a big transmitter. Um, you know, so why are they all pointing that way? That's got to be part of the conspiracy if that's true as well. Um, mobile phone companies, you know, GPS, meteorologists. If, if, if you don't mind me interrupting, I don't mean well, to be rude, but... Oh, no, right. The question is, and now if this was a six mark question in an exam, you would have got zero so far because it's scientific proof that we're looking for. So I want something that conforms to the observe the phenomenon, um, establish the hypothesis, identify your independence so that you can prove your dependent variable and prove that cause effect relationship. So let's yeah. think of the things that are actually scientific that get close to or at least at least gives us something to talk about because what you've actually done is appeal to authority. You've um, it's a, it's a fallacy to make the um, 
the uh, what's it called the something ad populum fallacy I can't remember consensus ad populum fallacy which is appealing to all of the the body of so called evidence but the question is what scientific proof is there that we live on a spinning ball okay good good question uh, yeah it's a fair point um, I'll not labour on with the the conspiracy theory except if I want to if I want to measure if I want to measure the density of something in the lab I can do that quite easy I can make a scientific measurement of something and to me that would be scientific proof the pictures and the videos to me are those observations you know and those measurements they are proof but if we if we expand from that a little bit and we look at um you know even simple thing i'm sure you've heard this over and over again but the moon looking upside down when you're in australia you, you go around the globe you see the moon in all its 360 degree orientations the star trails moving in opposite directions um when we look at well if, i mean well, i'm sure we'll touch on gravity etc later on um the movement of PNS waves uh, and uh, surface waves. Are you familiar with PS and surface waves uh, moving through the Earth? Now we're getting there. So let's let's talk science. Do we see an, ob uh, an observed phenomena? Well, I would say that looking for an observed phenomena, and then if you're going to go down the observed phenomena, identify you know your hypothesis, the independent variable. That would be for trying. That would be when we're trying to find a link between an independent and a dependent. We're looking for a relationship between two things, right. which is different than a measurement, for example. So if I wanted to measure the wavelength of light using young slits, there's not necessarily an independent variable in that. I'm I'm setting up my diffraction grating. I'm using n lander equals d sine theta, and I'm making a measurement. But there the does PS have to be there does have to satisfy the definition of scientific method um, for it to be scientific proof. It would need to have a uh, scientific evidence with it because you need to manipulate the independent variable to cause effect to the dependent variable. So the issue is if we live on a spinning ball, it's either spin or ball. So it's either rot axial rotation or curve. So what is the scientific proof that there is axial rotation or curve? Well, if we've got, let, if we talk about the, the PS and the, the surface waves with an earthquake, seismology works by... Uh, the seismologists all over the globe having the the seismic detectors and they will move up and down uh, which is when they detect a p wave which is a longitudinal wave that, that strikes first and then move side to side when the s wave hits um and then finally the l wave will hit and you get a little bit of both um so what would be the, all what, over the earth what would be and the phenomena have, oh sorry mate. yeah so the, the observed phenomena is that we have an earthquake okay okay now that earthquake does cause yeah, uh, obviously tremors and waves that w we all can accept that okay and those tremors and waves are detected by those detectors all around the earth and by using obviously very clever sophisticated computer programs they can draw up where the epicenter of that earthquake occurred and what the structure of the earth must be as the waves pass through them because we know the different properties of each type of wave so if we want to manipulate that phenomena you know then essentially what we need to do is move the point that the earthquake happens, which nature does by itself. So we get an earthquake in one position, and then we wait for the next one, and then we wait for the next one, and then we wait for the next one. They happen all at different locations. So your independent variable there is, is the position of the epicenter of the earthquake, and nature provides that for us. But every single time, the pattern of the P, the S, and the surface waves that hit those detectors always, always you know, uh, gives the same result that they must be traveling through a, a globe that has, um, well, the structure of the increase in density traveling right through to the core. All right, so the, the, the observed phenomena is earthquakes, yeah? Yes. So what would the independent variable be? It would be the position that the earthquake occurs. And how would you manipulate the independent variable to prove the causative co um, connection or the causative effect to the dependent variable, which would go ultimately give you the, either the curvature of the Earth or the rotation of the Earth? So the dependent variable there is the intensity and the timing that the waves hit the detectors. All right, That's the effect. So the earthquake uh, happens, which is your independent variable, and depending on the location of that earthquake, the detectors will pick up uh, different intensities of those PS and, and surface waves, and they'll happen at different times. Right? So there's, does that make sense? So that's your dependent. Yeah. That's your effect. Are, are you sure that you're able to manipulate your independent variable to cause effect to prove causation? Well, the independent variable in this instance manipulates. It changes itself. If you said to me, "Can I cause an earthquake?" You know, in the middle of, of, of Manchester now. Obviously, I couldn't do it. But if you said to me over a five, ten-year period. 
can I guarantee that there will be earthquakes at different positions across the globe? Yes. And to me, that will fulfill my independent variable of changing the position of the earthquake. So even if even if I was to accept that that's an independent variable for the purposes of falling within inside the scientific method, the fact that you're not able to manipulate it, if we swerve that a little bit for a minute, how would you then prove the shape or the spheric the, the the rotation of the Earth as a result of the earthquakes? And this this is obviously something that in this hangout is going to be impossible for me to do to you now, right? Because the P, the S, you know, it's quite a complex. Um, quite a complex thing but essentially for anyone who's interested in looking into it and you know getting on youtube and, and seeing the detectors themselves looking at the the timing that they basically a p wave travels a lot faster than an s wave right now when the p wave hits a detector first it will have an up and down motion when the s wave detects it it has a side to side motion and if the gap between the p wave and the s wave hitting is bigger the earthquake must have come from farther away. Imagine imagine having a race with Usain Bull. Over 50 metres, he can only beat you by 50 metres. But over 100 metres, he can beat you by 100 metres. Right? And it's the same thing with the P and the S wave. The bigger the difference uh, in timing between the two, the further away the earthquake must be. So the detectors can re reliably tell us how far away the earthquake is. We wow. also know the behaviour of P and S waves in different medium and... Uh, how they refract through the surface. Sure. And, uh, but except, how, so how, we're extrapolating the shape of the Earth based on the data. But essentially, no matter where the earthquake occurs, that extrapolation, not presupposition, right? But the extrapolation of that always gives us a curved Earth. And that's without presupposing a curved Earth. So how would you prove by independently manipulating the variable, the independent variable, in this case the earthquakes, which we established didn't fall within the scientific method, but if we swerved it for the sake of discussion, how would you prove causation between that and the effect, whatever the effect is, to prove the shape of the earth? Because you need to manipulate it, right? So how are you going to manipulate? Um, I don't, I'm not even sure that, show, that by doing a seismology effect would show anything as regards the shape of the earth. It's, it's, it's about interpreting data, right? and, and I, I totally get that. And I can't create earthquakes in a different part of the planet. But to me, you know, we, we, we obviously have different views on it. But to me, if I'm going to say that the independent variable is the position the earthquake occurs, even though I can't create an earthquake in any position I want, I know over a period of time, earthquakes will occur in different positions. To me, that satisfies an independent variable. The dependent variable is the effect that has on the... Uh, the seismometers that are all over the world, right? Whatever shape that world is. Now, when when that data is collected, it doesn't matter whether the independent variable, you know, the position of the earthquake, was in, you know, America or in Australia or wherever. We always get the same conclusion from the data, and that is that the, the Earth is is a globe. Right. But we're not but that's, we're not that's me based on data analysis. I appreciate that's easy for me to sit here now and say that's a fact, that's data analysis. Um, that's something to be looked into. So, with regards to seismology as a, as a science, um, can you see my screen still? I, I can see you. I can't see anything come up. Let me share my desktop. Do you now see my desktop? Uh, I do, yeah. All right, so the, the, the first question is um, about the scientific proof that we live on a spinning ball. So with regards to seismology, this is, a, this is a, um, an article to do with the Kohler Super Deep Borehole. Are you familiar yeah. with it? Yes. It's the deepest hole that we've ever dug. Anything beyond eight miles or so is basically no one's gone deeper than this. Yeah. And in this article, it talks about um, seismology. And I'll read from the paragraph. It says, The study of the Earth is often largely limited to surface observations and seismic studies. But the coal, the coal borehole allowed a direct look into the structure of the crust and put geologists' theories to the test. One of the most surprising findings was the absence of the transition from granite to basalt, which scientists had long expected to exist between 3 and 6 kilometres below the surface. Known to geologists as the Conrad discontinuity, this transition in rock was reasoned to exist due to the results of seismic, refre reflection, flay, seismic reflection surveys um, and then I'm looking for this bit. Um, here we go. Instead, the granite rock was found to extend well beyond the 12 kilometer mark. This led scientists to realizations that the seismic reflection results were due to a metamorphic change in the rock, 
and not to a change in the rock type as they previously anticipated. And the point of this is with regards to seismology that they thought that they knew what was underneath there and they were able to make predictions with their model on seismology. But when it came to applying it, that they got results that they weren't expecting at all, indicating that the reliability of seismology as a thing wasn't that scientifically accurate because it didn't do what they expected it to do and it did the opposite. So then my question would be that if we were following the scientific method and we gave you leeway with regards to the inability to manipulate the independent variable, in this case um, uh, earthquakes, then how reliable is the information that you're extrapolating from in the end when seismology itself accepts that in the call of the super deep borehole, they did not know what they were going to get. And well, they, they thought they knew what they were going to get, but ultimately they got the opposite of what they were going to get. So to me, we like, when we're teaching reliability at schools, so if any kids are watching, they better learn this definition. Uh, where if something's going to be reliable, it has to be reproducible over and over and over again. And if, you know, if, I did it, if I did an investigation and I got different results every time I did it, uh, you know, I got lots of anomaly results and it's, it's anomalous results, then it's not reliable. With the P and the S and the L wave, um, and the surface wave, sorry, the conclusions are, consistent time and 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 time again and reliability is, is about reproducibility and that's what happens now here i'll point out this is a different you know uh, seismic reflection and looking at the refraction of waves through the earth are two different things and i'm certainly not a seismologist myself so um you know i'm not going to start you know i'm just going to take that as face value what you put there that, that they've they've drawn a conclusion that's been proven to be false well, yeah, the, say... the, the, the issue is falsifiability for me because if if they can make predictions about what the earth should be under drilling under certain conditions but then it turns out that the information didn't do what they were expecting that's a um, a verifiable issue that's like it lacks credibility in the first instance because the, the predictive model wasn't strong but in addition um is it if it's data that you're extrapolating from the fact that's falsifiable in ultimately because they could falsify it to support the idea because it is data in its raw form, right? So my, it's twofold. It's, is it reliable in the first place and is it falsifiable? Um, and the lack of reliability in the first meet instance makes it kind of not strong in my opinion. I, I Again, I'll go back to the definition of reliability for me, which is over and over and over and over again without variation. And that's, that's what we get. Um, you know, with the the conclusions drawn from the detection of the seismometers, um, you know, so I guess that would be my response for that. I, all right. I, I mean, we've got five questions to get through. What I'll do is I'll just say at this point, I wouldn't concede that that was scientific proof. If, yeah. if for me, um, there is evidence that shows that seismology is neither accurate um, and can be verified. Um, but ultimately, ultimately, we've got to go with the scientific proof. So I'm going to claim at this point, at least, that you haven't presented anything that's scientific or proof that we live on a spinning ball. So on that point, I would say that you can't ultimately claim that the science there, if there is evidence that the science that you're relying on is unreliable and um, is falsifiable anyway with basic data. Um, so ultimately, my conclusion on this point, um, unless you want to say something further, is that it has to be scientific and seismology is not exactly reliable. They can make predictions, but it's not reliable falls outside the scientific method, makes it a pseudoscience. Yeah, I, I, I would say there's there's no way that I'm going to prove, you know, doing this hangout now with you, that the, the earth is, is round. The, the biggest proof that I would offer, and again, you'll have heard this over and over and over again, would be, you know, just, just look at the pictures. But then I would be saying, you know, you prove to me that that's not true. You know, and, I'd, I'd, and, and I know that's not the purpose of this hangout, but that would be, that would be what was going through my head. So what you've just said then is that it, in, in its most concise form that you at the moment you are, you're not able to prove that the earth that we live on is a spinning ball with scientific proof. Other, other than proof I can offer you which you will claim is falsified. No, I would say doesn't satisfy the scientific method. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Okay, so let's move on to number two. Yep. Gyroscopes do not show any rotation inside a plane or when sat on a window ledge. A gyroscope is a mechanical device that's not influenced by anything. It maintains its rigid rigidity in space. It does not get influenced by anything as far as we can tell. 
Um, although we do see some that gets affected um, at a certain time of the year when there's an eclipse, and I can't remember what it's called now. Uh, but anyway, point is that gyroscopes uh, maintain rigidity in space. Um, that being said, if you were to fit a gyroscope inside a plane, and of course all planes have gyroscopes in them, they use them as one of the primary instruments for navigation. They can tell where the horizon is meant to be when they can't actually see the horizon in the event of a storm or bad visibility. They know which way is up, which way is down. A gyroscope fails to show any curvature that the plane is supposed to be flying around if we live on a spinning ball. Um, if it, fly, it takes off from Manchester, flies across to New York, it travels around about 20 degrees or whatever the degrees is. So what should happen on a gyroscope is that when the plane takes off, the attitude indicator will be set to the runway when it takes off. But by the time it flies around the curve of the Earth and it lands in Vegas or wherever, New York... When it lands, the nose of the plane should be showing on the attitude indicator that it's landed in the ground. That would reflect the curvature of the Earth that we're flying around. Or there should be some corrective mechanism inside to allow for the curvature of the Earth based on things. And therefore, you should be able to identify the corrective device that allows for the curvature of the Earth. Um, secondly, if you put a gyroscope on any window ledge anywhere on the Earth, we should have one, one rotation every 24 hours. That reduces down to 15 degrees every one hour. And we should be able to observe that anywhere on the Earth with a gyroscope. So any just sticking a gyroscope on the window ledge, 15 degrees in one hour should be the, the measurement of that rotation of the Earth that we all experience. Yet no, no gyroscope does that. And there is no evidence to support the assertion that it does. So gyroscopes fail to prove the rotation or the curvature of the Earth and therefore are the biggest proof that there is an argument for the argument there is an argument for the idea that we're not on a spinning ball not necessarily that it's flat but the idea that we're not on a spinning ball because if we were a gyroscope would show the rotation of the earth when it sits on a window ledge and it would show the curve of the earth as the plane flies around it uh, do you have anything to say about that yeah this would be a quick one for me gyroscopes uh, something that i've you know know very little about so all i'm going off here is, is what I've, I'm going to give you the counter argument that I've got basically from having a look on Google, I'll be honest, because I, I don't know anything about gyroscopes in, on a personal level. Um, but to me, you know, a gyroscope, it maintains its angular momentum. Would you agree with that? Would I agree with So ask the question again. So a gyroscope is designed to, to maintain its angular momentum, yeah? Well, it's not designed. It does that as a force of nature because it spins, it creates its own inertial plane and it maintains its own rigidity in space. So basically you can manipulate a three axis gimbal around it, but the thing in the middle of the gyroscope will maintain whatever angle you set it to at the beginning. It will maintain that angle as you manipulate the three gimbal all the way around it. Yeah. Now, again, this is a, this is a counter argument to the question that, that you know, I've, I've asked, I've had to ask other people on this. I haven't got a gyroscope. I've never owned one, never used one. But as far as my understanding of gyroscopes is that to create an ideal, you know, perfectly working gyroscope, what you need is a huge gyroscope to overcome the frictional forces that you're going to get from the bearings, from the, the, the table, and any kind of movement of the earth is, is insignificant and negligible compared to the frictional forces it's going to feel. Um, you told like you, you told Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so go on. Who's, who's told you that? You need a massive one. Um, two people. One is a physics teacher um, that I, I know very well. He's got a PhD in physics. I used to work with him at another school. Um, I had a chat with him. Uh, the second one it basically was backed up with, with Google as well. I, I spent literally only 10 minutes on this question thinking, right, I don't know much about gyroscopes. I don't want to go on and start pretending I know loads about gyroscopes. So I'm just going to give you the stock answer that I've been told and then hope that maybe that's something you've used before or you've heard before and you can talk to me about it. Can you see my screen still? I can, mate, yeah. All right, this is a guy called John Savage. He's well-known within Flat Earth, and your students will not have heard of him, um, but everybody in Flat Earth knows about him. And basically, what he did was he got um, one of these high-precision um, gyroscopes that are so high high precision that basically they cause numerous problems in the, uh, the discussion because um, there was a lot of back and forth um, over these gyroscopes. And what I'm going to show you is... Um, a huge amount of back and forth in his videos so if i go back to all of his videos you can and then if i do the sort by most popular you'll see the most popular ones are the most important ones which um basically the gyroscopes in this video show that planes are not flying over no curve which was my one of my points 
Blackburn, but the guys had quite numerous videos just on gyroscopes because he was able to get a, a gyroscope and set it on a 24 hour clock instead of a 12 hour clock. Um, and that gives you your 15 degrees. Um, and what he was able to show is that not only, aside from the fact that planes don't fly over no curve, he was able to show that the earth, if you get um, a gyroscope and set it on a mechanism, um, I'm not, I can't remember, I've, I've just gone off the video that um, I was going to use, so it may not be it. No, I'll have to find the one. What he did was he got he got criticised because the wire was influ possibly influencing the result. So he took the wire off, added batteries to it instead, and then added a counterweight to make it balanced. And then he did one, which was um, a friction bearing test, which is the point that you're making. And what he did was, because there's a clock mechanism underneath, it's a 24 hour clock, not a 12. Um, and what he shows is that in a 15 minute period, sorry, in a, in a in an hour's period, it will rotate the 15 degrees when you put a clock mechanism underneath it. So I'm quickly spinning through it now to show you that as the as he's going on, he's showing that the, the mechanism will respond if you put a clock underneath it. And that mechanism therefore is demonstrating that the friction in the bearing is less than the ability of the gyroscope to maintain it. And look how small it is, it's on his desktop. And this is like, it wouldn't need to be massive to be able to show the demo to demonstrate the required 15 degrees in an hour. It just needs to be any gyroscope because the 15 degrees an hour is a really, really small movement, but it can comfortably demonstrate it without it being huge. So I'm not happy with the explanation that it needs to be huge. Um, I'll be honest with you, there was an argument about the wire. Um, he took the wire off, put batteries on it and counterweighted it so that it didn't, uh, to compensate it. Um, but you should look at his channel to see these um, all these arguments unfolding. But in the end, it got to the point where his point was so strong that he stopped responding to people anymore because um, he was getting the same results time after time after time. I think this is the one here. Um, when he put the when he got rid of the wire, um, he, he counterweighted it with batteries and a counterweight. And then basically, um, he, he was showing that on this occasion, that there was no movement in the earth whatsoever. And if the earth was moving, there should be that 15 degrees of movement in an hour. And there is none. So on the one hand, you've got the friction of the bearing point, which I've just showed you was demonstrated that we can show 15 degrees of movement in a small scale gyroscope with just a 24 hour clock. Um, but equally, we don't see there any movement in the earth when there's no mechanism underneath. Now, the difference between the two observations is the wire, but he was challenged to show that the wire, the power wire wasn't creating any influence. So when he set it up again without the wire, then it didn't show any influence. But the argument about gyroscope still stands um, they do not show the required 15 degrees of momentum every hour because the Earth's spinning. It doesn't happen, and it also doesn't happen on a plane. Um, so big plugs out to uh, John here because he shows that, oh, this is, this is the three-axis gimbal, but anybody that's interested about whether or not we live on a spinning anything should look at John Savage's channel because he shows that when a plane flies around a curve of an Earth, it does not show it in their internal gyroscopes. And there is no mechanism for correcting it inside. They claim that there are pendulous veins and they claim that there are gravitational um, pendulums that affect that, that correct for the curvature, for the gravitational variances or nonsense like that. But you can look on his channel and you can find out. Um, I, don't, I, can't, I, don't, I don't remember it being this guy, actually. I remember it being another um, gyroscope guy. But he showed that uh, when you split down a, a, a gyroscope inside an attitude indicator inside a plane, there's no mechanism whatsoever for, in, for correcting for so-called gravity because there would need to be some kind of gravimeter in there, and there's not. It's totally mechanical. Um, so the idea that, a, that a, a gyroscope doesn't show the curvature of the Earth stands true. And as far as I'm aware, it hasn't been debunked by anybody. And the ball has argued for months and months and months that friction in the bearing was the cause um, for why they didn't move. But John satisfactorily, in my opinion, shows that you only need a small scale gyroscope and you only need, um, is it that one? You only need a small scale gyroscope and a 24 hour clock mechanism and then just set the thing up and it'll do exactly what the argument that says that they can't do, it'll do. It'll show the 15 degrees of momentum in an hour. Um, and it sh basically, if the Earth was spinning, we would expect to see it. Now, of course, if the Earth was spinning and it can detect this 15 degrees of momentum in an hour, you could then set it to your exact longitude and latitude orientation and you should be able to double the rotation of the earth because of the angle that you put it on um, because that's the thing that this would be if the earth was spinning you would see that if you got the correct angle then you would be spinning with the rotation of the earth and you would then see 30 degrees in an hour and of course that does not happen so you have to ask yourself the question 
why are gyroscopes not showing the rotation of the Earth if friction of the bearings is one of the reasons for why not, but we can demonstrate that that's not true, then what is stopping it from showing that the Earth's either spinning or indeed curved when they're in a plane? Because both arguments are credible and they basically show that the Earth is stationary, not moving at all, and it's not curved. So what, sorry, that, that one you've just shown me there, where it is actually moving, what, what's the cause of it moving? The one where it is moving 15 degrees now, what's the cause of that? He's Why got is it he's got a 24 hour clock mechanism underneath. Can you see the black circle underneath? Right, okay, got you. So he's got a 24 hour clock mechanism that the, the, the whole gyroscope is sat on. And basically what he's done is he's created it. I don't know how he's done it. He's, he's tinkered with it. I don't want to use the word tinkered. The word is bastardized, but I don't really want to say that because he's a school teacher, but that is the word. He's, he's, he's physically turned. He's modified it to allow the top plate to spin from with, with the bottom plate to give the momentum required of 15 degrees in an hour. Um, and the guy is completely contactable. You can contact him easily by clicking on his link and then you can contact him by clicking the about thing. And then you can send him a message there and then say you're not a robot, and then you can say, hey, John, is this true? And he'll get back to you. I mean, you can get, you can get to John through me. I speak to John. Um, so it's not as if this is unverifiable science. This is real science that we can validate and we can repeat ourselves. And I would challenge you as a science teacher to stick a gyroscope on at the beginning of your class and an hour later and then see what it doesn't do and then come up with the reasons for why when we can demonstrate that the friction in the bearings is something that a little gyroscope will overcome and prove that that's not stopping it from happening, we can demonstrate this to be true. So I would say, well, demonstrate it that, and then come up with the, the, the reason for why. Gyroscopes should show 15 degrees an hour because we are supposed to be rotating at one revolution per day, 15 degrees an hour. We should see it, but no, no gyroscope ever does it. And you're, you're like a good... A, oh, sorry, I didn't... You're, you're, like a, a, a you're a good question. example. It's not, uh, like I say, gyroscopes. Out of all the questions, gyroscopes is one thing. Where I thought, oh, I don't know anything about them. You know, I don't know anything about it. So I didn't want to come on and pretend that I did. I don't. But that sounds like a question that, um, you know, I'm going to look into. And then maybe stick a little video or do a bit of back and forth when, I, when, I, when I've uh, educated myself a bit more on them. But with the one where it was moving, in, in that one, he was applying an external force. There must nope. have been some external force applied to, to that it, one. It's the clock mechanism underneath. Look. So the clock mechanism, the force from that is, is overcoming the friction bearing, is it? What well, basically, somebody said that the force... The, basically, the main problem with this experiment is that in order for the gyroscope to move, the static friction in the bearings must be overcome, and the Earth rotates too slowly for that. A control, yeah. For a control experiment, you should build a rotating platform that makes a full circle in 24 hours to simulate the Earth's rotation, and then test that whether your gyroscope can detect that slow motion. It won't. It will rotate with the platform... Another problem is the motor cable which interferes with the gyro. Mechanical gyroscopes are usually too crude to detect the Earth's rotation. You need a much more sensitive device. It can be done with a magnetically levitating gyroscope, but a Foucault's pendulum is a lot easier to build. Um, so what he does is he then builds the mechanism. Well, this is a clock mechanism. Uh, I don't know whether he shows it in this video, but I'm sure he'll have showed it somewhere. But he puts the clock mechanism underneath the gyroscope, sits the gyroscope on top of it, and then shows that the gyroscope, even though it's not as scientifically precise as people, but bear in mind this is with the wire on it. He did it again without the wire on it um, to show that the wire wasn't causing any effect and he got the same results. Um, but basically this shows that the mechanism underneath, which is the clock that spins at 15 degrees in an hour because it's a 24 hour clock, not a 12 hour clock, shows that the, mo the movement of the clock is replicated by the gimbal that the gyroscope sits in. So you, what you're seeing is the, is the, is the, um, the rigidity in space of the gyroscope forcing the gimbal to move, which is represented by the 15 degrees in an hour, and therefore the friction in the bearings point is lost because the gyroscope will do it if you put 15 yeah. degrees in. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to claim that you know I've suddenly debunked this or anything like that because it is something I've got to look into, but the one obvious difference between that and a gyroscope on a window ledge, for example... If you've got the mechanism under that turning, then essentially um, the, the center of the gyroscope that's sat on that, you've got the, the rotation, the 360 degree rotation right underneath the center of the gyroscope. It's twisting beneath it. Whereas if you've got a gyroscope on a window ledge, the window ledge isn't twisting beneath the gyroscope. It's, it's rotating around the circumference, whatever circumference that will be due to the latch. It's a different type of movement that to me, 
and I'll articulate this better, another, but to me that's not an accurate representation of how the Earth is moving. Well, the friction in the bearing point comes from the idea that the gimbal that the bearing sits, uh, the gimbal that the gyroscope sits in, has more friction against it than the gyro that's sitting in the middle spinning has. In other words, the gimbal moving here, when you say it's the rotating disc that's got the friction on it, it's not. It's the gimbal that the disc sits in that's supposed to have yeah. the friction. Yeah. So, but this is showing that when you put this friction, this problem friction to the test, put it on a clock that does spin, then at 15 degrees, that's enough to show that it does it exactly the way you should expect it to do. But if you don't think this is right, being a science teacher, being a physics teacher, you would be the ideal man to get a gyroscope paid for by school, show that this is wrong in some way. Yeah, no, this, this, is, this, is, this is something I'm definitely going to look into. My gut tells me that's not an accurate representation of what's going on, but I need, you know, I, I need to go away, do my homework a little bit, and then be able to come back and articulate that better. And who knows, maybe I'll be wrong. Well, to be fair, the guy's really, he's really approachable, but he's a guy that's off the grid, so he's not that easy to get hold of, but I can get hold of him. Um, he would be great to talk to, and I can get you in touch with him. Um, yeah, do but be aware that he's, blown, he's gone back and forth that many times. I mean, look at how many videos he's got dedicated just to gyroscopes. And a lot of these are counter debunkers. Um, somebody claims one thing, he then redoes the experiment to show that it doesn't happen. Somebody else claims something else, then he, he redoes the experiment. To, like, there's an example where he's changed it. He's changed it because he was criticised for having the wire, because the wire would be pulling on it. So he got rid of the wire, put a battery pack on it, and then put a counterweight... And then the argument was that he didn't get it balanced perfectly. But, I mean, it's showing that it's perfect now, but the argument was he didn't get it perfect and that was creating a torque. And it was to do with the position, the exact position of the uh, the weight here on the arm. But basically it got to the point where it became so ridiculous that he basically gave up on them um, because they were getting nonsensical. But as a science teacher, if you think that you can offer crit fair criticism and whatever, I'm pretty certain that he would be happy to oblige if you're not just being an idiot. Because a lot, a lot of these idiot, the other people that he classed them as idiots in the end. Because how many, how many times do you have to do the same experiment and get the same results before it'll be accepted? And in the end, they just, he just gave up on them. But well, I'll tell you what. Let, let's do. If I can get my hand on a gyroscope, if I can borrow one from somewhere, we don't live that far from each other. You know, I've got six weeks off coming soon. If I can come up with, you know, some sort of investigation for it that you're happy with. Why don't we do it together? We'll do like a joint venture. We can both film it, whack it on our own channels. And, well, um, the the, be the better suggestion would be to research John, uh, John Savage, um, get a dialogue with him, get a back and forth with him so that you can speak to him and then do it through him. I mean, I'm just a messenger. I'm just using the fact that the friction of the bearings point that you brought up, we can demonstrate the friction of the bearings point doesn't do what you say it does, which is stop yeah. the momentum of the earth. We can show that it does. Um, and indeed, if he was to orientate that gyroscope in a particular way with the disc, it should actually be double the rotation because it's the Earth's supposed to be spinning. The fact that he gets 15 degrees when the when the platform's moving shows that it's the 15 degrees an hour. But if the Earth was spinning, that 15 degrees would be in addition to the Earth's spin of 15 degrees. We should actually get 30. But he didn't get 30. He got 15. So it's the fact that he didn't get the other 15 degrees, i.e. the Earth's spin, that proves that it's the Earth not spinning. Are you with me? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with what you're saying. Like I said, I'm not an authority on gyroscopes at all, so I'm not going to... Uh, the, the only thing that's going through my mind is, is you know, that the Earth isn't necessarily spinning beneath the gyroscope. You know, if the gyroscope was bang on the, the, the axis on the north, then the Earth would be spinning beneath it. No, but it's, no, no, no. You know, it's, Any, it's anywhere really on the Earth, Earth, the Earth is spinning by one revolution per minute. You're confusing angular speed or velocity, uh, uh, tangential speed with... Um, the, the rotation, it's always one revolution per minute, regardless of whether, where, wherever you are. And that momentum will be demonstrated on one plane if you're one axis if you're at the North Pole, or two axes if you're somewhere in the middle between the equator and whatnot. It would be one axis on the equator. But if you're in the middle, like me and you are, there should be two, um, two axes moving at the same time because you have the rotation of the Earth, but it's also supposed to be on a tilt. So that is also a movement. So there should be, but really the main one is the, the one rotation per hour, 15 degrees. You should always get that regardless of where you are on the earth because you're always rotating once. Yeah, no, I, I do get I do get to I'll, I'll articulate myself better when I, I come back with a, a video on that, but I need to go away and look at, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on him because I'm not, um, but I will look at that and come back and let you know what I found. Most people accept that most people in flat Earth realize that gyroscopes are the biggest, strongest proof because there's not been a, a, a credible counter to them. 
Um, there is something called um, in a ring laser gyro that is basically non-mechanical. And they say that, um, well, it's the mechanical that overcomes the friction of the bearings point, which we can we accept already that that, that point's already been proven. But they, they come back with this inter- laser interferometer thing. And that's basically a non-mechanical gyroscope, which uses accelerometers that is shielded against certain, certain other atmosphere conditions. But um, the problem with that is it's influenced basically um, by magnets. If you get a magnet too close to it, and that's like within like 100 feet of it, you're going to start manipulating the results. So the question then becomes, well, what is it you're actually measuring? Because it appears that you're measuring the electromagnetic effect, not actual Earth movement. You're measuring something else that's moving that's probably the ether. But in science, the ether doesn't actually exist. Um, nobody accepts that the, the, the ether has been proven um, because science says so. Um, mm-hmm. But then again, there are other examples where the ether has been demonstrated, but they're open to interpretation. And for the purposes of this discussion, it isn't worth getting into. But the argument is that these guys can't show the rotation of the Earth. And ultimately, because they can't show the rotation of the Earth and we can demonstrate 15 degrees with a gyro, we have a contradiction in terms. Right, you've sent me some homework there. I'll have a look. Yeah. And it's good homework as well, because you, being a science physics teacher, you would be the one that would be credible to, to debunk this. If this guy's got it wrong, then you've got the challenge there. Why are the gyroscopes not showing 15 degrees? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I will get back to I will, I'll do a video and I'll, uh, I'll get in touch with that guy. And we'll see. Yeah, I'll learn a bit about it. So number three, gravity. No experiment or scientific evidence is able to distinguish gravity from density. Now, this one, I... Um... I think is is a totally false claim, um, right? For a couple of reasons. First things first. If objects falling was due just to relative density differences, all right? So let's say you know something's falling through the air. You know and I know as something falls through the air, the air becomes uh, the air pressure, the air density is is greater near the surface of the earth, isn't it? Okay. Yeah, we can measure that. We get like a barometer. We can we can measure it. Now. <laughs> Movement through uh, a medium. Just just run that by me again. What did you say? We can measure what by? We can measure the air pressure. Oh, the air pressure. Okay. So, yeah, all right. sorry. Sorry, what do you think I said? No, I, I, I didn't want to mishear you, but it's okay. Go on. The air pressure. We can measure the air pressure. I'm going to say that in loose terms because the air pressure, that's an, I- that's an issue because in science, the definition of um, pressure is the forces exerted on the walls of a container, specifically in regards to a gas pressure. Um, it requires a container and the walls of a container to push against. No. So, no. 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 Pressure is a force exerted by a, a gas on something it hits. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a container. The force comes from a change in momentum when the particles hit something and bounce off. All right. But it doesn't have to be the inside of a container. So uh, have you seen the collapsing can experiment, for example? Uh, yeah. The, um, the big um, railroad thing that was on uh, Mythbusters. Oh, that, yeah, we, we, we do in school with, like, little Coke cans and stuff like that. But uh, essentially, it's the same thing. Um, you know, and that's pressure coming from the outside of a container. Um, same with underwater. You know, water, if you think about water pressure, the ocean isn't in a container, but yet you still get pressure the deeper you go underwater, don't you? Yeah, but the, by definition, the gas pressure is caused by the pressure exerted on the walls. It was in that, pe- that paper that you gave me, the scuba diver. I got six marks, I think it was, for saying, or it might have been four, for saying where the where the gas where the pressure came from, and it was the um, collision between the particles, which we can't and the measure. Walls of the container. But it's the pressure being pushed against the wall. So yeah, that that question was asking about the pressure inside a diver's tank. Now, inside the tank, it's the pre- it is due to the collisions against the wall of the container. Absolutely right, and that you got four marks for that. So, but, but how how do you measure the pressure the the pressure when it's not got the walls of the container? Well, you measure the pressure on the surface that the the air is applying the pressure on. <laughs> are you not measuring the density gradient, not the pressure? I think we need let's let's look at both. Let's look at both. Okay, air pressure. I can demonstrate air pressure simply with the collapsing can experiment. I can demonstrate it simply by taking a a balloon from. I can blow a balloon up at high altitude, and I can walk all the way down to the ground, and it will deflate. But yeah, if I release the gas that's in it, um, or I take it back up to the, the, the where I uh, blew it up at the top of the hill, it would inflate to exactly the same size. So when, because... you have the, when you have the can, you have the four walls or the six walls of the can that provide the ability to crush it, right? The, the can is open. It's not a sealed system when I crush the can. It's an open can. 
So you can demonstrate a can being crushed when it's open because of air pressure? Yeah, it's on one of my videos. Can you get get my channel up now? Or, let, or let me get this, not... let, just let me get this straight. You can demonstrate air pressure crushing a can when it's an open can? Yeah. Okay, let's see it. Right. I'm going to have to put the dog um, down. Have you got... I've got I've got some crappy old videos on my channel, um, but it's. Can you get it up? Yeah. Uh, what, do you know what the name of it is? I think it's gas pressure. I, I literally think it is gas pressure. So let's just be clear, so we're not wasting each other's time. This is going to demonstrate how an open container can be destroyed by gas pressure with it being open. Yeah. An open container yeah. with fluid inside and outside. So we're talking about gas, though, aren't we? Fluid dynamics and gas dynamics are not the same, right? Well, ga no, because gas is a fluid. Yeah, but it's got... The, the problem is, fluid is a friction material, gas is not. So there, there's difference, there is a difference between fluid yeah. dynamics and the, the behaviour of gas molecules in air. They, they, they behave... I, I, I disagree that gas doesn't provide friction, otherwise we wouldn't get a terminal velocity. Yeah, but gas is a said, friction I'll material. I'll explain the experiment. And then if you think it doesn't fill it, you don't have to hunt for the video. But essentially, you open a can, you empty the contents, and you put a little bit, just a little bit of water in the can, and you heat it. And as it starts to give off steam uh, and get warm, the air inside starts to um, starts to expand, and it pushes out a lot of the air from the inside out of the can. And then you instantly cool the can by picking the can up, turning it upside down, and putting the top of the can. Uh, in some nice cold water, uh, just to touch the surface of the cold water is all that's needed. It cools it, and then from the outside, the the can's crushed. Do you want to show me where it is? Yeah, if you go to playlists. Yeah. Yeah, that was the video I made of Dell, by the way, that uh, he wasn't too keen on. Um, there should be. Have I got one just called? Every uh, it'll either be physics or every everyday science stuff. It could. It could be that. If not, there's a there's a physics one. If you click on everyday science. Gas pressure quickly explained. Yeah. Now, somewhere in that, and it's not a great video. This is when I'm learning to edit. Okay, I'll be honest. It looks horrendous. But in that is the experiment I'm talking about. You're going to need to point it out. If you... Oh, I can't scroll across, can I? Um, oh, you clicked the wrong one, though. You clicked moon landing one. No, I clicked on everyday science stuff. Yeah, no, that you you were in the right playlist there, yeah. All right, okay, so the playlist. Yes, yeah, sorry, is the, the video was there. Can you see on the right above Supergirl? The video above Supergirl. Yeah, this one. Gas pressure quickly explained. Yeah. So you're going to so show me. So you're going to show me how an open container can be crushed by virtue of pressure in an open container, right? Well, the can is, like I said, it's dipped onto the surface of cold water. So here's an open container. There we go. That's open. So, that's open. So the t if you go back to that. Right, the top of that, that's an open container. What they've done at the bottom... Yeah, but it's got a seal into it. It's got what, sorry? It looks like it has a, a top to it, a lid. Well, do, do it with the can. So the can there, the, the can will explode, show it in more uh, better detail. It's the same principle. This can is an open can. And as soon as it's cooled by touching the water, it's crushed. And you can see the water that's been forced into it by the air pressure, then dripping out the can afterwards. So that is an open can. It's we not do really this open, though. It's not... It, it, sorry, sorry, it, sorry. It's not it's really open. open. It, it does have a hole in it, but that doesn't mean it's it's open. We, the earth that we live on has got... Basically, it's got no sides and no ceiling to it. What you're demonstrating is... is is. I would argue that what you're demonstrating here is um, a, um, a concentration of an air movement, a differential in the air movement coming out the hole, not an open system. I uh, well, I and I love that you use this this clip as well because we all use this clip as well. I love it. I love it. I'm surprised I'm not being copyrighted for it uh, for that one yet. Okay, well we can disagree on that, but in terms of the density, um, to me, if you know, if we, even if we ignore that, that the density of the Earth increases. you uh, every everything we see. If you're saying uh, falling objects are down to relative density, then by that model, the Earth by the ground must be more dense. Is that true? Yeah, well, and we know that the air by the ground is more dense. Yeah. So when something falls, so when a skydiver jumps out of a plane the and he starts to fall, he's by your model, he's saying he's falling because he's relatively more dense than the air in the plane, yeah? Yeah, he's displacing the air below him because he's denser than the air that he's in. 
Absolutely. And if he was a helium balloon, he wouldn't, and he'd, he'd float up in the air, yeah? Yeah. But as he starts to fall or move towards the ground or move through that medium, the air itself is becoming more dense. But he is accelerating. And it's in, it, if it was relative density alone, it would be impossible for him to actually accelerate into a more dense medium. Yeah, but what you're talking about is a microscopic variation on the density of the air that he's falling towards against a huge change in velocity as he's falling. So you're comparing a really small effect against a really big effect. But really, if you were going to argue, go on. Well, sorry, sorry. Well, let's just say then that the air density doesn't change and it doesn't get any denser. Why is he still accelerating? Because he's displacing the ground, the air that he's in. He's not. He's accelerating because the air that he's in is less um, than what he is. The, his relative density state is greater than the air that he's in. So he's naturally going to displace it because that's what happens with density. But the point is I, that you can't show that it's not density. You need to show that it's gravity. Oh, I can't. I, well, I mean, if we extend it, and this is something that I've done again over and over. Uh, you know, we take a bell jar and in school we get a vacuum pump we pump all the air out and then we drop objects of different shapes different masses different densities and they do fall at the same speed and if it was due to density differences then why do things still even still still appear to fall in the vacuum because there is no density you know relative density gradient and why if it's down to density that's not true you have any object any object be it a feather a cannonball anything has an object, if we were going to give it a value of density in a vacuum chamber, its value would be one, and then the air around it would be zero. So yeah, that's something else. So when I said no density, I'm talking about the um, the uh, the vacuum itself. So the vacuum itself, there's no density there, but the so objects it, falling maintain their density. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah, but the value, yeah, but the problem that you've got is that the density of the vacuum at zero is greater with the object, whatever the object is, of one. So what do you think is going to happen? If I got if I've got two objects, right, one has a density of, you know, one uh, kilogram per meter cubed, another one has a density of ten kilogram per meter cubed, then there is a difference. If the vacuum has a density of zero, then one object has a, a relative density difference of, of one. The other object has a relative density difference of ten. So if it was just down to relative density they should not be falling at the same speed in a vacuum. But they wouldn't if the other if the other object had a, a density of... Oh, you mean the relative speeds? Yeah, so, th yeah, why... why yeah, but hang on, hang on, hang on. What's the independent variable in that observation? The density. Have... No. You've removed the air out of the, out the vacuum chamber. The densities so have been removed... kept the same. Right, I, I, I think... Go on, explain. I think I might have misheard what you're saying. Go on. Well, you have the, you have, you have the, the vacuum chamber... And you yeah. have three objects at the top of it, and the three objects are going to fall. But because it's a vacuum chamber, you remove the air out of it. So when the air's in it, they all fall at a different rate. But when you remove the air out of it, then they all fall at the same rate. Agreed? Yes. Right. But what's the independent variable? Is the independent variable the air that was inside there that's now not there anymore? Right. So Yeah, so you're saying the independent... So if you remove the atmosphere, things are going to fall. And that, that's kind of my, my point. No, because the independent variable was air, and we've removed the independent variable and proved that there was a causative effect between air pressure on the rate of objects falling. So we remove the air pressure and show that they all that it changes. So the independent variable is air pressure, therefore the cause is air. So it's not the density of the object that's been influenced. The independent variable is the air. You remove the air, and then you get the, the, the dependent variable, which is the change in velocity between the objects because of air resistance. So the de the independent variable is air. It's not gravity. No. Right. If we've got, let's say we drop two objects in the air. So the air is, is there, yeah? Yeah. The more dense object we see will fall faster. We agree with that. Uh, not necessarily, no. Cause well, it's the same the volume. not more dense. Okay, yeah, because you could have a, a dense small one and then a really big heavy. So two objects, you know, the same size, the same shape, two marbles. Right the more dense one will fall faster. Okay. And that's because you're saying that the density difference between the dense marble and the air is bigger than the density difference between the light marble and the air. Right, but that's with the air in the container, right? Then you remove the air out of the container, 
and then we see an effect. So therefore, so the independent variable is the error that's no longer in the container, and we're seeing the dependent variable being the, being the rate that the velocity changes. So the independent variable is the error in the container, therefore the cause is the error, not gravity. So what is when they fall in the vacuum? If they are displacing the air when they fall outside the bell jar, or you know, what are they displacing in the vacuum? Zero. The v the value of zero. The air has been removed. You're proving that there is a causal link between the independent variable, which is the air in the container, and then the dependent variable, which is the rate that things fall. Because with the air in, they fall at one rate. With the air out, they fall at a different rate. So the independent variable is the air in the container. Therefore, you've just proved that air pressure is a thing. Air resistance is a thing. Oh, well, the air resistance absolutely is a thing. So if you remove the air resistance, why are they falling? Because, because if, it's dense, if, if it's about relative density and something displacing another medium that's more dense. Right. So what, what medium are they displacing when they're in the vacuum? Well, whatever you've got, be it, call it a grape. If you get a grape and you drop the grape in the, in the we'll give the grape the value, the density value of, say, 0. 0.6. And we'll yeah. give the air resistance a value of, say, 0. 0.2. The grape yeah. is greater than the 0. 0.2, so it will naturally displace it. But when you remove the air from it, that 0. 0.2 becomes zero. But because the grape is still greater than the 0. 0.2, or now zero, it's still going to fall. It's still going to displace that which is in there, which is nothing, because it's got a value greater than what, but greater than zero. And I think this this will be my argument is is it's you you aren't display if if the driving force if I threw a ball through a vacuum and I I applied a force to it it would move through the vacuum uh, you know I could accelerate through a vacuum but what is the driving force to cause the movement to displace nothing if it was down but, to density but, but, if, if it was density differences causing that movement. In fact, I agree because we get that. I let a helium balloon go, and the density difference causes a helium balloon to go to the sky. I totally accept that. But what is the driving force that re is? Remember what? what remember what the question is. The question is how do you distinguish gravity from density? Because what we're arguing over now is whether it's density or air pressure. Ah. But we're well, not arguing over gravity. Here's the here's the thing then. That I, if we take a helium balloon, and I'll do a video on this, uh, and we put that helium balloon in a vacuum, that helium balloon will not rise. It will not displace the nothing above it. What will a helium balloon do in a vacuum? It will fall. It bursts. Well, if you if you get the, the pressure differential so big, if you if you inflate it, no. then no. so much that it is gonna burst. But if no. you only put a little no, bit no, of no, 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 that's that's not right. A helium balloon in a vacuum will burst. Unless it depends on how much, how strong the balloon is. No, it, what depends on is how big the balloon is relative to the vacuum it sits in. If the vacuum it sits in is only just a little bit bigger than the, the balloon itself, then it won't burst. But if you put a little balloon inside a big vacuum and it's a true vacuum, that balloon will just go because it'll just burst. Well, I mean, if I looked, if I looked at like a hospital um, oxygen, because basically you're looking at basically being able to handle the pressure difference between zero pressure and some pressure, aren't you? And, and that's what you're saying. If I took like a, a, a hospital oxygen cylinder and I emptied it, um, it you know, the, or I took the bell jar, which is a better example, and sucked all the air out the bell jar. The bell jar has got that structure. It's strong enough not to implode, not to. Sm so what I'm saying is the balloon itself. Yeah, if I got a balloon from a shop, yeah, it will it will burst. But you know, the balloons, for example, that took Felix Baumgartner up there, you know, they can handle that difference. Yeah, but look what's happening with this helium balloon. As you remove the ox the air out of the box, the volume increases of the helium because it's expanding into it's be there's a pressure differential being pulled. Abs pulled. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. the balloon wouldn't drop. Definitely. The balloon would burst before it gets a chance to drop. Unless unless you were able to find a happy medium. See how this is getting to the point where it's gonna fill it. If you had an absolutely massive one and it was strong enough to withhold the pressure of the the, the, the differential then yeah. I agree the helium balloon will drop. But most of the time we're not able to do that because usually it'll fill this. I mean, where do, unless you've got something NASA-esque. But anyway, that that doesn't go against... We're going. We're, how is that related to gravity? Because we're arguing about the effects of air against the effects of no air. How yeah, are we so proving so gravity lost, with I've it? Lost, I've lost my phone on that one. I, I, I forgot where we've gone. My, my point being that essentially the acceleration, if it was down to relative density alone... The, the speeding up until you hit a terminal velocity 
should be impossible. Now, the terminal velocity is where the air resistance comes into play. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, but again... But why should you accelerate into a more dense medium? How are we getting to gravity in this, though? Because I'm my point is that you can't distinguish gravity from density. And I think that you're demonstrating that your inability to demonstrate gravity because we're still arguing about density and air pressure. Well, in terms of, in terms of numbers, I'll just mention one more thing, then we'll get to the, the numbers on that. Um, consistently, all the way around the world, the more dense object moves towards the Earth, doesn't it? Now, that says to me there must be a directional component. We never let go of a hammer and it flies up through the air. It always falls down reliably, 100% every single time. It always falls towards the ground, always. And if it was just down to density differences, there has to be a, a directional influence on that. Now, you can say what well, the directional influence is, whatever. I'm going to call that gravity. There, there is nobody can defy the directional influence it's there and the directional the directional influence that i'm talking about is what gravity is that's the distinguishing factor right so at this point then on this point that basically i'm saying that my position is that you can't distinguish gravity from air pressure or density well i actually said um, density so um, we're demonstrating quite clearly at the moment that we're still talking about that um but ultimately gra let's go back to the basic definition of gravity right yeah. Unless we're going to go with Einsteinian gravity, which is the bend in the space-time, which if you want to go with that, you're going to have to show me some space-time that you can bend. But the, generally, the, most people accept the Newtonian version of gravity, which is the, the attractive force of a body towards the centre of the other force. You know, like bodies of, of attraction. Like, basically, there is a force of attraction between bodies. Yeah. I'm going to assert to you that to disprove gravity, or to prove gravity, the only way you're going to be able to do that is by getting a bigger body of greater mass and greater volume relative to the earth and then pulling it in a close proximity to an object that you want to influence so your independent variable would be for example jupiter you're going to yeah. bring it close enough to the earth and the brick that you've got in your hand and then when you let go of the brick you're going to bring jupiter at different levels of closeness relative to the brick to show an effect on that brick being the, in the dependent variable so your independent variable would be jupiter and the proximity to earth how, and that's the independent variable, your dependent variable would be showing that the brick at some point goes up, and then that would be proving gravity as per Einsteinian's definition, uh, as per Newton's definition. But if you wanted to do it as per Einstein's definition of gravity, you're going to have to show me some space-time that you want to bend. But well, either way, that's what you need to demonstrate to show that gravity is a thing. Let's have a look then. Um, you know, if we're going to go down like the experimental route, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to talk... Cavendish or anything like that because I've, that, that conversation has probably been done a million times over um, and either you feel it's been debunked or you don't feel it's been debunked. I don't think anyone wants to listen to us talk about that. But um, I, my pen's not great up here. So if I give you some observed phenomena, yeah? So we go to the uh, uh, Eratosthenes experiment, which again, you, you may say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to question that because it presupposes an earth. But let's just stick no. with me for a second. No, no. That, what, that was fear, sorry. That, that, no, no, that doesn't. No, that, that's not what I would say in response to Aristophanes. Perhaps if I give you my response first, it might save us chance of, of uh, moving on. We might be able to move forward because it might save you time in demonstrating it. Yeah, if on. depending on what math you apply, presupposing sphere or not presupposing a sphere, then the Aristophanes event uh, 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 measurements either prove a sphere or don't. So if you assume that we live on a sphere and then apply spherical trigonometry to it, then your answer that you get out of it will be a sphere. But if you don't assume that there's a sphere and you do it based on a flat plane, then the answer that you get back from it doesn't assume that we live on a sphere. And whatever that answer is, isn't based on the presupposition of a sphere. Therefore, whether you presuppose a sphere or don't presuppose a sphere governs whether you get a spherical answer or not. So what I'm saying is it depends on what maths you put into it to govern what you get out of it. So no. are you going to presuppose we live on a sphere to prove that we live on a sphere? Because if you are, then I'm going to say, well, let's presuppose that we don't live on a sphere, and then which one's correct? Right, so, yeah, no, that's a really good point. I think when I get to, yeah, it's a good point. But for now, and you'll see where I'm going with this, can we presuppose that we're living on a sphere? For, no. For, 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 well, no. can I? For the, can, for, for, for the, the rest of this explanation. No, and we can't we'll presuppose that we live on a sphere to prove that we presu to prove the presupposition that we live on a sphere. No, uh, no, this is this is going to be linked to gravity. If if Eratosthenes was correct, oh sorry, if Eratosthenes, if we do live on a sphere, then the calculation Eratosthenes give us 
would give us the radius of that sphere if we lived on it. Are okay. you happy with that? Yeah. So we, we've got an R value, which may or may not be true. But if we are on a sphere, on a sphere that is the R value. Okay. okay. Now, uh, the Cavendish experiment, which again, you will... Uh, was a completely different, completely unisolated, uh, sorry, unconnected experiment that okay. had nothing to do with Eratosthenes, things, had nothing to do with the shape of the Earth. If that was right, if that that did give us a value of G. Now, if that value of now the question is, is that value of G right, or was it? But hang on, hang on. We need to go back to the um, the uh, Cavendish experiment that doesn't link to um, the Eratosthenes because there is a causal link. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it all together in a second. Honestly, I'm not gonna be too long on this. I will bring it all. No, together but hang on, hang on. We need to agree or disagree that there was a causal link between the two, because Cavendish gave us little G, did it not? No, Cavendish gave us big G. Big G, little G. Yeah, hang on, he is... gave us a gravitational constant. Yeah, gravitational constant. Right. Okay. My apologies. That, I got that the yeah, wrong no, way that's around. That's all right. That, so that's big G. Right. So is so that based on the experiment... radius of Earth? So go on. Is that based on a radius of Earth? No, that was based on um, between the, the suspended balls and he, and he drew that from that experiment. Yeah, but to get the big G, the math that was applied for big G, did it have the, the radius value in it, R, in it anywhere? Uh, not to my knowledge, and somebody may want to debunk that, but not, not to my knowledge, no. I'm pretty sure that Cavendish proved little G, not big G. I might, I might have that wrong, I'd have to appeal to well, it. Little G and big G, you'll see in a second how they're related. But... Okay. We've had, and you know, I had this all in my head earlier on, and I've I've kind of forgotten now. But somebody else at some other point, and I'm gonna have to Google this, has at some point calculated what they think the mass of the Earth is. Right, now, but they think isn't necessarily the same as prove, though, is it? Exactly. No, you're right. Exactly. So, so is, is therefore the rest of this point not then moot? No, because I'm going to show you where this is going. Okay, uh, okay. And I'll be there in thirty seconds. So we've got three things that either are true and the Earth is a sphere, or they're not true because everything was. Um, these unrelated measurements were all, um, how can I put it, uh, were all flawed, right? But if I take those numbers and I type in, oh, I don't know if you can see on here, but you, oh. can you get the uh, the formula for gravity up? The I'm just looking to see what the Cavendish up. experiment did do, because my understanding was it was proving big G, uh, little g, um, and I just want to check. If you click on the gravitational constant, it was the first. Look at that second line. The first to yield accurate values for the gravitational constant, which is six point six seven times. Oh, there it is. Times ten to the minus eleven. Can you leave that formula up? Is that okay? That equation yeah. up. Yeah. Right. So where we've got g m one m two over r squared, the r squared that we're looking at can only be true if the Earth was a sphere based on Eratosthenes' uh, model. The the g the big capital G there can only if, if Cavendish was, was correct, then it can be correct. If Cavendish wasn't, then that big G we, we get rid of. And the other experiment that, that gave us a mass of the Earth, I can't remember, but either that was right or not, and that gives us M1. All right? Ignore the M2 from that formula. So we've got G M1 over R squared. Now, force equals mass times acceleration. M2 in that formula, can you see the M2? Yeah. That gives us the mass of the object that we're going to drop. Right. So G M1... Well, that's the mass I'm going to drop. Hang on. The g m1 over r squared gives us the acceleration. Now, when I plug in the numbers that were randomly generated for g, for m1, for r squared, the acceleration they give me is 9.8, which is the acceleration we measure. Now, if either that is the biggest coincidence anybody has ever seen in their entire life, or that radius, that value for g, and the mass of the Earth are correct, because they together in those unrelated experiments. So, so just humor me. So, sorry for interrupting. What's okay? Just talk me through this. And I'm all right with this bit. I'm all right with this bit. What's this value here for R? Right. No. Sorry. When I say the equation, you know the one below that says F equals. Um... No, no, no. What's what's this value for R? Oh, that's the distance between the two balls. So that'll be that. That'll be, um, in other words, the distance between the center of the Earth and the center of the mass. The thing of the thing you're dropping. So is that not therefore R being the radius? No, the radius, if you imagine M1 as being the Earth, right, then, ah, okay, when we're talking about gravitational uh, acceleration, we do use the radius of the Earth, because if I, let's say I drop this pen now, right, then this pen, pretty much, if we consider how big the Earth is, this is only going to be, what, one metre above the radius of the Earth. All right, so, so what I'm going to so my next my, question, my, hang on, my, my next error. question is, how do you prove the value of that R being, do you know what the radius of the Earth is? It's six. 
6,308 something like that. I can't remember. It's, it's less than 7,000 uh, kilometers. Yeah, 6,000 and something, isn't it? So radius yeah. of... 638 uh, something. So based on the fact that you're... 6,000... 6,371. 6,371. So bas- basically, you've got in here, you've got the radius of Earth, 6,371 kilometers, correct? That's not what R is, no. R so is what, the what's radius R in this, then? Is the, the distance. The distance Two between what? The distance between what? The R is the... Basically, it's the radius of the Earth plus the distance from the surface of the Earth to the centre of the object that's being dropped. Right. So you, in your sum, you're calculating that that assumes that we're on a sphere. Are you not? No. What what I'm saying. Right. Let me let me come on. This point. It's Can either yes or a no. Is part of your equation yes or no? Is it part of your equation that the radius of the Earth is assumed yes or no? The distance to the centre of mass is assumed, which would be the centre of the Earth. Yeah, which is why I said at the beginning, with, uh, well, yeah, which is the centre of the Earth. Now, whatever shape you want to make that take. Yeah, but hang on, uh, hang on. Do you remember before when you said, can we presuppose that we're on an Earth for the rest of this? And I said, no. Yeah. The same applies here, because if you're going to have the radius of the Earth as part of your equation, then we can't go forward on the presupposition of a radius that you can't prove exists. Okay, I'll tell you what, let's turn my point apart in a second. Just give me one, if you just start the clock, give me 60 seconds to uh, give you my point and then rip it apart. Okay, go on. Okay. Right. So, if Eratosthenes was correct and the Earth is a sphere, we get the value of R from that. But that could be a presupposition which we could we could rule out because you're saying we're, we're presupposing the Earth. If big G, the gravitational constant, um, if, the, if the Cavendish experiment was correct, then we get that number for big G. But if it wasn't, that number's flawed. And for the experiments that calculate the mass of the Earth, we get the mass of the Earth number. And if that's... Uh, if that was flawed, that would be wrong. But when we take g m1 over r squared, which which gives us acceleration from those three numbers, and then we actually measure that against acceleration that we see in the real world, the pre- formula predicts acceleration per kilogram of 9.8, and we measure 9.8. So if those numbers were wrong, and all those three experiments were wrong, then the coincidence for them to actually appear to be 9.8 is unbelievable. Yeah, but it still presupposes that the radius is there in the first place, regardless we, of the remoteness. You said the maths for for the uh, Eratosthenes will will either be correct if it's if it's if it's a flat Earth, it's correct. If it's a round Earth, it is correct. And what I'm saying is, the fact that this works out to what we actually observe in the world. If I have to choose between, is it a flat Earth or is it a round Earth? Knowing that 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 number we got actually then predicts you know, the, the acceleration that we actually see, well, I have to say, to me, it's around her. But I would say that Aristophanes is based on a presuppositional R value, and your explanation for this, um, the uh, Cavendish, is mathematically calculated on the presupposition of an R value, and your point is that if both of them were correct, then the math does work out. But my yes. point is that if you presuppose two things that you're presupposing, all you're doing is affirming the consequence of your presupposition. You're not proving causation, you're uh, proving right. correlation. I see what you're saying, yeah. I, I think if he'd have worked backwards, if all these three people that did these three different experiments had all got together and said, right, let's measure the acceleration of something that falls and then presuppose that it's gravity that does it, presuppose it's because we, were, we, we live on a sphere, and then and then create experiments to, to make these numbers, then I totally agree. But these numbers all came completely independently, and together they give... They no, do they didn't come together. independently. They're directly linked to Aristophanes' claim that we live on a sphere based on spherical maths. That's the my R point. The R value does. The R value does. Yeah. That's the yeah. point. You but, can't use a presupposition of R value in your maths and then claim that it's, it supports the presupposition of the, of the R value in Aristophanes when Aristophanes was the presupposition in the first place. You beg, you, well, you, what you're doing is, you, uh, I just gave the phrase a second ago, you are um, affirming the consequence. You're not proving that there's a gravity there in the first place. You're just saying that the maths on the two models support each other, but they're all both based on the presupposition in the first place. What you need to be doing is showing that the gravity is, according to Newton, is an attractive force between masses. So you get a wrench, you drop it, it hits the floor, boom, gravity. Right, so the only way to satisfy the, tr- the true scientific method is to get Jupiter, bring it close enough to the wrench, and then let go of the wrench and let's see if Jupiter's gravitational pull will pull the wrench out of your hand and go up. Well, 
All right, we'll agree to differ on that that first bit. But on the on the what you just said there, if we look at the formula, GM one M two over R squared. If I basically what you're saying is I need to get a bigger mass to measure a bigger force, yeah? No, you need to get a bigger mass to show that you've got the independent variable, which is the bigger mass, and you're gonna yeah. you're gonna manipulate that. That's your independent variable, and you're gonna influence the dependent variable, which is the direction of this acceleration that you claim is down because of gravity. You're gonna manipulate that and get it to go up. So then you will prove gravity. If I I don't like, I don't think I can get something to go up because gravity is a directional force. But I can manipulate M two. Well, it's not. It's so not. It's, no, no, no. It's no. Oh, stop. That's not right. It's not directional in the sense that it's up or down. I'm using that as a relative term to express the 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 direction relative to the center of the Earth's mass. But gravity, by definition, as Isaac Newton, is the gravitational attraction of masses between each other. So if you have the Earth's center of the Earth and you have the wrench in your hand, then the attraction between the Earth being huge and the wrench being of less density is that the, it will pull the smaller object towards it. But by that definition by Newton, the only way you can prove that to satisfy the scientific method is to get a planet of bigger mass that you could independently manipulate to cause an effect on the dependent variable, which would be the direction and the speed of travel, in this case down, to show that if you were to pull it close enough, the gravitational mass of the bigger thing, in this case Jupiter, would cause the wrench to move up. So then, relative to it, so we would call it up. That is the oh, only way. Saying, yeah. That's the yeah, only so way that the scientific method would be able to be satisfied to demonstrate true gravity by its own definition, unless you've got a little bit of space time that you want to bend. I see what you're saying. So you're saying basically, I take a bigger. Uh, bigger mass above the earth and then it'll like a tug of war between the two that's what you're saying or accept that you can't prove gravity inside the scientific method i i th think we agree to differ on this one i think that when you create something which then pre without presupposing what gravity is now erratenstein's his experiment his his what he did had nothing to do with gravity he was thinking about the shape of the earth and either it had to be flat it, or it had to be round, one of the two. And for, you know, the Cavendish experiment as well, to, to come up with the value for G, finding all three of them that actually give us the exact acceleration that we see, the exact acceleration, to me, that's, that's all the evidence I need that those three numbers are correct. And then I can take the mass that I'm dropping, which will be M2, and I can alter the mass of M2 and predict the force that it's going to fall with, and we can measure that force, and it all works together to me quite, you know, fantastically. And we, without presupposing what force we're going to get, it, it works. So you could say we're, we're basing it on the predictions from the formula. For me personally, that's enough. But I understand if that's not not for you. Are you familiar with um, a, a doctor of science, a doctor of physics called Walter Lewin? It's a name I've heard. I've heard it on a YouTube video lately, actually. Um, I can't remember. Go on, just give us a, a jog. Basically, he states that gravity is not capable of being proven. Gravity cannot be proven. That's a guy with a PhD. Um, he accepts that it's um, a belief. Well, I, I, can't pr I, I can't prove gravity. I, I can't do it. I can't explain how it works. You know, to me, that's part of the wonder. You know, uh, Part of, of the wonder? See, that for me is a hole in the evidence. But I, well, like I said, and I think that's that's probably where we branch off because I think we agree on a hell of a lot, and we get to that point. To me, it's enough that those measurements in completely separate, unrelated experiments, you know, separated by decades, if not hundreds of years, then come together to give us the acceleration that we actually measure. Well, to be honest, to me, I mean, we, that's enough. We're, we're, we're drawing to the end of the third point, and you said then that we agree on quite quite a lot, but we've got three points here that we've not been able to find consensus on. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. say in this context of this hangout that we've agreed on anything because we haven't managed to get consensus on either of the first three. So if, we, if we're going to move off the third point and move on to the fourth point because time's a bit of a thing, okay. that we've, we've not actually agreed on anything so far in this hangout. Even okay. out, forget about outside of the hangout, but in this hangout yeah. we've agreed on nothing. No, that's fair enough, yeah, okay. So Blackpool Tower, my fourth point. Um, Blackpool Tower can clearly be seen from Hoylake and Wirral, a distance of 29.7 miles at the beach. Um, it's right next to the RNLI lifeboat station. But almost all of it should be hidden by the curvature of the Earth. 
that's the claim by the sphere, by the science that we're supposed to accept that almost all of it and i've got there's many examples but this is just one that your science kids could relate to because it's close everyone knows where blackpool tower is you're in the Man manchester area the kids will be familiar with it they can test it by getting out to birkenhead or to wirral um, and they can go and stand at the beach where i stood um right next to the rnli lifeboat station and if they know where they're looking and a p900 camera which is about to be superseded with a stronger one you can see blackpool tower across 30 miles of, of tidal water and according to the sphericity of the earth <clears throat> almost all of it should be behind um, the curve of the earth and yeah. what I'd like to now present is a hangout that I had with Mick West, who is the author and creator of the so-called Metabunk Curve Calculator. And in this hangout, I showed him the evidence that I could see of Blackpool Tower. I'll make this a bit bigger. Uh, you can see I'm down in the bottom corner. Mick West is in the chat, and I've got uh, Rich from Thrive, uh, Mr. Thrive and Survive. He's got like 45, I think, or 70,000 subs, can't remember. But that's a photograph that I took at the time of what I could see. Now, if we're, we're supposed to live on a ball... That's not what we're meant to see. What we're meant to see, and this is basically the tower, as you can see. This is the ball that goes on top of the uh, roller coaster. And Mick was polite, um, polite and friendly enough to show me what it should look like on a sphere, which is that. So all we should see on a sphere is right on the horizon, we should see the ball part of the top of the tower, which I know that you're familiar with. But mm -hmm. when I actually did the observation, I got to see... Bear with me, well, I've lost it momentarily. Where's it gone? I got to see all of this. This this is the tower I could see. There's the roller coaster, which you can see here. Now, what Mick managed to do was he managed to overlay this in such a way that I didn't ultimately agree with because it didn't match. But ultimately, he tried to explain this away. Now, this little light that's down here is the, is the love heart that's facing um, left of picture. It's not on axis to me, it's facing away from me by 90 degrees because I'm looking from the south. Um, but this is the love heart that appears just above the ballroom. Um, the two dots that appear there, I couldn't find the original pictures, you have to forgive me. I have some. I have them somewhere, but I might have to go back and do them, redo them. But these two lights here were these two lights that are on this, um, it's either that one and that one, or that one and that one, whichever. But these are on the south pier, um, and the light that's on top of the roller coaster can be seen here. here. And what he tried to do was manipulate this to squeeze it in to make it form an argument that actually I'm only seeing the top part of the tower with a little bit more refraction is what I'm actually seeing. But he didn't account for the lights at the bottom. But the point is, you can go to Blackpool, you can go to Hoy Lake with a camera at 30 miles away, stand basically on the beach, and at night time, because it's lit up and you don't get as much refraction, you can see basically right the way down to the sh almost the shoreline. Now there is a point that you can't see. And there are our argument is that well, as long as there's any, as long as there's some obstruction, any obstruction's curvature at the moment because they're clinging on to this obstruction being curvature no matter what any obstruction will do. But the curvature is supposed to be right at the top where the tower of the ball, the ballroom is. Now this is a real world experiment that a science teacher could do, and you could go and test the theory that we live in a sphere. You'd have to do it at night time. It'd have to rely on reasonably good visibility. But with a P900 camera, you can take all the kids up there, and on the sphere Earth, we should not see this. And it yet it's clear that we can see it and we can see pretty much down to the beach now there is a debate over what you can see and that's where you have the the argument or the debate with, with your school kids based on the um, the evidences that they get but ultimately we can see way further than what we should see because we should only see um that that's all we should see and it should be right on the horizon we were clearly seeing significantly above the horizon so back to my claim i would agree that's Oops. what we were let's get back to my claim um, let's move this out of the way. Uh, Blackpool Tower can clearly be seen from Wirral Hoy Lake, 29.7 miles on the beach, um, but almost all of it should be hidden by the curvature of the earth. So my question is, why are we able to see down to the ballroom and beyond, we can see down to the South Pier, um, why can we see so far below if curvature of the earth is a thing? There's curve in the way, there's a wall of water in between us and it, and... We shouldn't see it, but we, according to the, the the claim, we can see only the top of it. So why is it I'm able to see so much? Well, there's only only two or three explanations for that. The first one is that you're right, and you know the Earth is flat. That you know that's one explanation for it. The second explanation for it is that the curve calculator, and I I don't use these curve calculators, is just wrong, right? And it's it's led you to believe something that, that wasn't true. There is curve there, but we can't see it. The third thing is, um, 
that maybe the curve calculator is right, but the absolute percentage uncertainty of your investigation um, hasn't been calculated properly. Um, now, I haven't been there. I'm not going to criticize any. I'm, I've never used the curve calculator, so I'm not going to criticize that. I know that you're an honest guy, and I know that if you're saying you can see it, then you can see it. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm not credited as being honest in Flat Earth because I go out and do stuff and get evidence that doesn't support the narrative, so therefore I must be lying. What I'll do, if you're up for it, rather than test it with the kids, I'll invite you to come and do the experiment with me live, real world, you can see it yourself done. We're in the middle of summer now. All we've got to do is wait for it to get to, like, um, te temperature-wise for it to drop, so the sun's got to go, it's got to set, it's got to get dark. Um, it's got to be illuminated. We'll have to check before to make sure that it is actually on because I've been there before and it's been off and you can't see it because it's too small, too black, too dark. Um, but on a day where we know that the weather's going to be good and we know yeah. that it's um, definitely going to be illuminated, I'll invite you to come and do the observation scientifically as best as we can with me and you can come and bring as many people with you as you want, school kids or whatever, and you can prove that, well, you can test the claim that we live on a sphere just by a quick journey over to Hoy Lake. What do you say? I'd love that. Let's do it. Definitely. Can we do it on a six-week holiday? Yeah. I'm, yeah. So I've got, I've got three weeks at work left, and then we'll be away for a week in the summer. But we, I'll keep in touch with you. I'm all over this. It sounds like great fun. It'll be a good day. Let's do it. Yeah, because all it takes is um, a low-level tripod, a little bit of visibility. It doesn't even have to be fantastic visibility. Um, and all we've got to do is set up a long exposure on the, um, on the P900, get it sat nice and low to the ground, because the lower the better. We found out that you can get it to about... Um, Literally, um, oh, actually, I'm just being told in chat that um, Blackpool Switch On is the 31st of August. Uh, P900 Cool Picks, I do believe that they still illuminate the tower at weekends, even out of season. Um, is that true, or is it off all the time out of season? Um, but we, if it's illuminated, I believe that it's a lot brighter. And when it's not illuminated, I believe that they still put it on at weekends because it's still like high season for them, but they, don't, they turn it off at 11 o'clock at night. Um, but we can check that. We can double-check it. We can make sure that it's definitely on at, on the night in question, and We'll just go and do it because me and Ranty have done it numerous times, and every time we go back, we see the same as the same thing. Um, they challenge us to go back and do it with one hand tied behind your back and hopping on one foot and shit, stupid things like that. Ultimately, we still see the same thing. So it's like every time, and you can see it by day. The only difference is by day, there's more obstruction in the air, there's more humidity, there's more evaporation, um, there's more dirt because of pollution and pollen and um, things that stop you from seeing. Um, and the claim is that that's the curve, but by nighttime, that curve should still be there. But when we see the night and the sun settling and temperatures getting down a bit so that things aren't as crazy as what they were by during the day, and it's lit at night time, that makes it brilliant, we can clearly see the same result time after time after time. And we've done it loads of times. But if you know what the, what the prediction is, and I've showed it you on this video, then we should only see the ball of it peeping on the horizon. But you can clearly see all of it. And it's like, it, ultimately, you have to question, do I accept the evidence that I'm able to reproduce myself? Or... Do I question that there must be something wrong with the camera or the curve calculator or whatever, but we can actually produce this. We can prove that the sphere claim is debatable, it is testable, and it fails to live up to the claim that we live on a sphere. The issue then becomes, well, why? But if you're up for doing that, excellent, let's do it, because it's a really yeah. good scientific experiment. Yeah, no, I'm all up for it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, question five, we'll, uh, we'll do that and then we'll come back. So I can't see the chat on here. Am I being uh, destroyed? Uh, no, actually, you're getting... Well, it's, it is what it is, but you did ask me not to present the chat, so I didn't record it so that you didn't get the chat, right? Oh, yeah, because if I put... Just so other people know, I'm going to put this on my channel, and uh, I keep swearing off my channel because uh, it's used by school kids. So, you know, I know sometimes some fruity language can be used in the chat, so it wasn't the case to keep it off because I was a bit precious. It was, it was, it was about removing sm uh, swearing. Right. So, but the point is that they do put the they do put the tower on at weekends, I believe, and it has been confirmed in by chat. Um, just to, out of curiosity, just pure coincidence. How many people do you think might be watching? What now? Yeah. I ain't got a. I am got a clue. Uh, Seventy-five. Seventy-three. Seventy-three. Oh, hi everybody. Seventy-four. Uh, right. So now one we're back. Probably. We're back to number four. So point four, um, do we have an answer for why we can see it or is it just the possibilities? Well, at the minute, until I come and do it with you, like I said, it's either. I mean, when, we, when we do physics, we we know there's percentage errors when we measure every little thing. So any kind of any kind of measurement has its own percentage error. And then we total all those percentage errors to get a percentage, an absolute percentage error. 
for the investigation. What I'm going to have to do before I come over is speak to you about how, what measurements were taken, how we're doing it, and then calculate what the overall percentage error is. Um, sure. You know, I, I, but at the minute, I haven't got, obviously, I've not got any of that. So I can't, I literally can't say anything. No worries. About that. You do whatever you want. You do whatever you want. Will do it. Right, so at this point, there's no science to explain why it can be seen. It's, it, we're back to we're back to the point, which is you need more time. Is that a fair point? Oh yeah, definitely. All right, so we'll move on. Last question: uh, Space does not exist, how we are told. No astronaut has ever tested a spacesuit whilst locked in a sealed vacuum chamber. Why is this evidence not there? Now there was, a vi- there is a video, one video of a site of a um, an astronaut testing a spacesuit inside a vacuum chamber. But it was called. It, they, they they pressed the panic button because the guy started to die, and they had to rush in um, and repressurize the container that he was in because um, it pulled the pressure differential pulled one of the pipes off, and basically his suit started to. Well, he bur- he's, 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 what his commentary afterwards said was that the spit on his tongue was beginning to boil, and literally you watch his feet fall backwards. But the cause was that the pressure, vo- the volume, uh, sorry, the vacuum pulled one of the pressurization um, pipes off that was feeding him o- oxygen, which was pressured because of the differential, and it burst off him and it nearly killed him. So they didn't do any more testings um, ever. They did not show any evidence of testings. As far as we're aware, they've not been done, not been tested at all. So the problem is, if space exists the way they tell us, and there is no evidence that spacemen in space suits inside a vacuum chamber have been satisfactorily tested, um, you have the risk of micrometeorites. You know what a micrometeorite is? Oh, yeah. Very fast moving, but very microscopically small, basically a bullet. Um, yeah. And there's trillions upon trillions of them floating around everywhere. They just fly out that space, right? Little tiny micrometeorites. Yeah. Um, a, an astronaut is incredibly at risk of a micrometeorite collision with his suit that's going to basically if it doesn't pass straight through the suit and him in it it'll pass through the suit and scar the suit and create a puncture um, but if it did that then he's in immediate danger very quickly danger and any normal risk assessment will tell you that what's the risk My, micrometeorites i mean there are other risks but this is just one example but micrometeorites are the risk what action can be taken to protect yourself against a projectile that's traveling at thousands of miles an hour that's infinitely small that will rupture your, your suit and it probably you if you get in between it and that and you can't there's nothing you can do about it because you can't predict when they're going to come unless you're carrying around in a, a massive load of steel um, you're not going to be able to guard against it but even if we accept the micrometeorites point the differential itself can why has no um spaceman ever been shown inside a vacuum chamber in a vacuum that we can prove is a vacuum not just by a needle but by putting water in there or whatever prove that it is genuine vacuum and there are flat earthers mark Sargent who has volunteered that if there is a space astronaut that is prepared to get inside a proper NASA astronaut suit, then get inside a vacuum chamber, turn the pressure off so that it makes the vacuum, and then get him out of it and he, and he survives, he will then validate that as true. And so far, we haven't been able to do it. But fundamentally, we are challenging science to see whether or not this is capable of replication. Now, there are vacuum chambers all around the world, and we have a guy who claims to be the son of an astronaut. His name is M. Scott Veach. And I'm sure he could pull some strings because his dad was a real-life astronaut. Daddy lied to him, but nonetheless. Um, he claims that his daddy was an astronaut, a real... And you can check him up. His name is uh, Scott Veach, the astronaut. That, that He is dead now, but um, he he should be able to pull some strings to be able to get an astronaut suit because daddy was a spaceman. So if daddy was a spaceman and we can get access to a vacuum chamber, it should be done. However, it shouldn't even be necessary because you can do a little bit of research and find out who it is that manufactures the spacesuits And you can look into their promotional videos and they're dead proud to claim that basically none of their spacesuits have ever failed. Yet when they show the testing process, they don't show anything to do with vacuum chambers. They show a man in a spacesuit and he's stretching to this and he's doing flexion tests and all that and mobility and movement tests. Never at one point did they show him inside a vacuum chamber, which is the main point. Why has no spaceman ever existed or why has no spaceman ever been inside a vacuum chamber inside a spacesuit to prove that a spacesuit even does what they say it does, regardless of the micrometeorites claim? That is really big evidence that the credibility of space does need to have and we're right to be beating the drum about it. These guys have not got the evidence to show that spaceman can exist in a spacesuit inside a vacuum chamber, which is what they tell the space is, and that evidence is really big, and it's missing. Why is that evidence missing? 
and why is why are we even having the conversation it should be cat sat on the mat stuff this it should be that's what happens inside a space uh, a space suit uh, inside a chamber and they can list they can exist for whatever and that's not even considering the risk of micrometeorites so the question is why does that evidence not exist and if it does exist why are we not seeing it when we're all screaming for it because we want to see a man in existence inside a spacesuit inside a vacuum and then see what happens it doesn't exist so <clears throat> i mean obviously this entire sort of question is is just going to be like subjective answers isn't it um no no me, no it should be empirical well should... if, if, if they could if they what you're saying is there is no evidence so yeah. the empirical the empirical fact at the minute is you are saying they are sharing no evidence. That's what you're saying. Say that again. So that what you're saying, like the your empirical measurement of this is that they are not producing uh, the videos and the, and the evidence of the astronauts being in the, the vacuum chamber. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So my, you know, obviously I don't work for NASA. My subjective answer would be and what you said before was really interesting to me when you said, you know, everybody's screaming for this evidence. Everybody's, you know, screaming for uh, the stuff to be released in a vacuum chamber. You know, and uh, do you think NASA are sat there? Do you think they are hearing that demand? Do you think they are? Absolutely. Jaron from Jaronism has made um, a Freedom of Information request. He wants to see all of the unedited uh, moon mission footages, which they can give him, but because it requires extensive amounts of um, administration, they wanted $70,000, I think it was. Um, and I don't know the exact figure, so don't quote me on it, but he's crowdfunded it, and he's going, he's now going to pay for it. He's, he's paid for it. He's had to send them in a brand new, completely brand new terabyte, X amount terabyte hard drives to get the information to him. But they're going to now, because I'm, I think that they would have been thinking he's never going to get the money, but he has got the money, $70,000, I think it is, or whatever it is. But ultimately, that, that issue is now going to be, they're going to be made to prove that particular point. But the, this is the kind of stuff that should be out there anyway. It's public domain. But this information doesn't exist. The original reels for, have only recently been found. They were found in somebody's attic. They'd been missing for 55 years or whatever it was. Now they've got the information back, information back again. And Jaron's found the 70 grand or whatever it is to get that information out of them to see what actually is supposed to have did happen on the moon. So that's obviously something that we're working on them. And it's not there yet, but it's not going to be far before it is. But if we did actually go to the moon, now they've got to prove that evidence exists because they've been paid. So we're all looking to see, and obviously whatever information that they give us back, we're all going to be looking at that and looking for, with a fine tooth comb and looking for numerous artifacts that shouldn't exist, like a Mondeo driving by in the background when it shouldn't be there, things like that. But ultimately the point is, the evidence is supposed to be clearly, I mean, there should be evidence of a spaceman testing inside a back chamber and because that, that's how spacesuits should be tested. But when you go to look at the testing for spacesuits, it's clear that the spacesuits are not being tested the way you would expect them to be inside a vacuum chamber. Um, but further to that point, and we mentioned it before, um, for space to exist, um, the gas pressure, by definition of a gas pressure, it still does require the walls of the container. So, yeah, we can create an, a vacuum man-made. We can create a vacuum. Um, but how do you have a vacuum in space, what they call space, without any walls for it to exist? Um, it requires them walls for it to be a vacuum. So it's like having like um, a, a tyre with no tyre. It's like having the air inside the tyre at 30 psi, but with no tyre. And the idea that, that that sounds to me preposterous, but ultimately there is no evidence of any spaceman in a spacesuit inside a vacuum chamber to prove that they can actually do it. That's why does that not? Why is it not there? Well, what what you said about the uh, the seventy thousand, just slightly going off topic for a second. I think there's people out there outside of you know flat Earth or whatever. I I I don't think the Earth's flat. I would love I would love to see the original um, video footage of the moon landing. I think it'd be great. You know and and that, when you get that back, that should either answer a lot of your questions or it will, it will raise a lot more questions and a lot more suspicion, won't it? It'll do one of the two. Have you not realised that the... Um, on, on, I know this wasn't um, one of the questions, but you know the Challenger disaster, the biggest NASA disaster that they yeah. had? Are you aware that the that of all the... I think it was eight astronauts, that, well, nine astronauts that died, eight of them are still alive? I've, I've I've heard that. Cons I mean, I've said to you before. I, lo I love watching conspiracy documentaries and things like that. That's on my list to to get through. Um, I mean, I don't I don't believe that, but like when I've seen the documentary, let me get back to you on it. So, by way of conclusion, let me just get rid of this screen here now. Um, 
So the five questions that I asked you were, uh, there is no scientific evidence that we live on a spinning ball, and you didn't produce any. We, we, we did talk about the scientific evidence, but you didn't produce anything that said that we did. You brought up seismology, and I brought up a, 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 an article that said that seismographs and seismology was not reliable in, when it was applied in the Kohler Superdeep Borehole. Um, so if that was the proof of spinning ballness, um, I would assert that you need to have a spinning ball. It needs to be round, and it needs to be spinning. So seismology, the unreliable predictive nature that it has, is not exactly evidence of a spinning ball. Um, I brought up gyroscopes that don't show any inertia movements whatsoever, and they should do. And I've challenged you as a science teacher to replicate some of the experiments of John Savage to produce that evidence to show that there is a rotation in the Earth and to prove, if not, that um, there's a reason for it and to prove that the cause of whatever the reason for it not being is actually the reason why it's not doing it because the assertion is that a gyroscope should and, well, it should do it. Um, we had a discussion about gravity, that there's no, there's no way to distinguish gravity from density um, because by definition, Isaac Newton's um, definition of gravity is that it's the attractive force between objects of mass. And obviously, the object being the Earth, the only way that you would be able to ma manipulate, manipulate that within the scientific method would be to get a greater object of mass, being Jupiter, for example, and moving it close in proximity toward it, um, the wrench, and then show that the wrench would be magically able to go towards Jupiter's gravitational pull. And by definition, Isaac Newton's definition of uh, gravity is basically putting it unattainable. You'd never be able to prove that gravity is something in the scientific method because you can't manipulate it. And that independent variable has to be there. Otherwise, it's not science that you're doing. It's something else. It's, it's non-science. Um, I showed that um, Blackpool Tower can clearly be seen from Hoy Lake in Wirral, 29.7 miles at the beach. Um, and basically, according to the geometry of the Earth, most of it, pretty much all of it, should be hidden by the curvature of the Earth. Uh, you didn't present any evidence to support the notion of anything that should explain why it could be seen. Um, and then finally, the evidence for space. Um, basically, there's no evidence that space should be a thing. Um, ultimately, there should be lots of evidence to show numerous things about space, but the big one that's missing is no spaceman can ever be shown in a spacesuit inside a vacuum chamber, and we really need to see that because it's key evidence that isn't there and need, really needs to be there. There is um, a, um, a, um, a challenge out there by... Mark Sargent and uh, M. Scott Veach, hopefully they're going to collaborate together uh, and get this up. Um, but what I do want to do is close with uh, this, because this is probably one of the best things. Um, when we had the back and forth in the conversations <clears throat> on email, um, you were talking about this appeal to, um, this appeal to the consensus opinion, uh, which I instantly jumped on. But one of the points that you brought up was, um, why would NASA lie? Uh, why would all the other people that are involved in NASA, why would they be able to have this conspiracy in the first place? And I brought back to you this um, Werner von Braun guy, which at the time you didn't know. And I said, go away and find out who he is. Um, and basically, Werner von Braun is, um, he is a rocket scientist in its, in its epitome of everything that is NASA. If you think about a rocket scientist, you have this illusion of this or this depiction in your mind of a guy in a white suit with a clipboard and he's very well spoken, very well presented. He is the epitome of science and space exploration and rocket technology. And basically, he's the guy that Red's rhetoric would um, 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 think about a lot at night times because he is the epitome of NASA. But the guy is on his deathbed. He's got a headstone in front of you can see it on screen now and it reads psalm 19 1 and psalm 19 1 if i go to psalm 19 1 it's brilliant because it's the epitome it's the antithesis of everything to do with space um psalms 19 1 reads uh hopefully i can get this but uh, one of these is um i can't remember which is the one that's really good for doing it is it the so that bible hub that's that. the one I think Bible, yeah, this is the one that gives it in all of its versions. And a lot of people generally tend to go with the King James Version because they claim that it's probably the best translation. Moot points, I agree. But nonetheless, it, it reads, um, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Well, if you're Red's rhetoric, for example, a big NASA fanboy, you would not die and put on your tombstone or your headstone a biblical phrase, which by, by virtue of the fact that it's biblical is referencing God, um, that reads that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork if your whole life was dedicated to rocket science. So if you're a Red's Rhetoric fanboy or if you're a, a rocket engineer at NASA and you have this as your tombstone or your headstone, 
what kind of P, uh, tip of the cap is that ultimately for me this is the proof that nasa are telling us lies because why would this guy do it surely the guy that went to the moon with the rocket saturn 5 that he designed and built and everybody spent trillions of dollars on to get this thing this fantasy wonderful space race up to the moon surely he would have said something like i built the rocket that went to the moon not something to do with declaring the glory of god with the firmament and, and the heavens it just seems to be the antithesis of everything that the guy would have spent his whole working career for. And if he didn't put that on his grave, the guy would be turning in his grave because it's the it's the antichrist for him. It is everything that he didn't he, he wouldn't have agreed with because he believes in heliocentricity. He believes in an ever expanding universe. He agrees in the solar system being all the planets that we can all fly rockets to. He believes that, well, he, he's supposed to have built Saturn V. Now, we all know that Saturn V did take off. But does anybody, is anybody able to prove that it went to the moon? And obviously that's a big debate in itself. And I'm not asking you to prove it. But the point is, it's the antithesis for what this guy stood for. Yet it's on his tombstone or his headstone. And the argument that anybody can accept anything from NASA when that exists is, in my opinion, ludicrous. And I know you didn't make that point. But fundamentally, I've brought up at least five points there. And I'm going to go with six by way of footnote that basically bring into question the idea that we live on a spherical rotating gravity pulling testicle because if you've seen the gravitational map that's out there it looks like a testicle and ultimately you didn't bring any evidence whatsoever to prove that we live on a sphere that's orbiting anything or spinning anything that's got gravity or anything all you actually brought was um well i'll have a think about that or i'll um you know um i think there must be people that have done it and ultimately you brought nothing but as a physics teacher evidence is king so I would say that as a as a physics teacher in this discussion, you sucked, man. I <laughs> thanks for that honest uh, honest brainer. I would say if you just bring the five questions back up, just as my uh, uh, part in conclusion, I I would say within that first question, um, you know that for me the, the scientific proof, like I said, we are, we have the proof, we have the pictures, we have the you know to to dis. Yeah, I know I've come here today and, and the onus hasn't been to disprove the globe. You know, it's, it's been more of a debate on it and I haven't proven the globe with that. But I still think that I've never heard anything that that would disprove, uh, you know, all the streams, all the pictures, etc. That, that we've got. I think the uh, the earthquake argument is reliable. It's reproducible, uh, you know, and I'd urge people to look into the P waves and the S waves and, and, and how that determines the internal structure of the Earth. I would say that one incorrect conclusion wouldn't wipe out the whole of seismology for me um i was absolutely tooled on question two because i came totally unprepared on gyroscopes even though you told me the question in advance uh, i was absolutely smashed and i've got to go away and do some homework on that question three i think i made a really really strong point when we're talking about force equals mass times acceleration and where we calculate that acceleration and are able to make predictions from it i th i think personally Objects accelerating into a more dense medium is proof that it's more than just relative density. Uh, and I know we disagree on that. I, I think that that was quite strong for me, uh, number three. Question four is to be decided when I come and do that with you. Uh, number five, um, well, I just can't wait for that, for those for those files. So either you're going to see those files when they come out and you're going to think, yeah, I'm really onto something here. The, the, they've shown us stuff we can tear apart or you'll see it and you'll think, right we've got a problem you know well, well what we'll what, I'm, what i'm going to do now is i'm going to bring this uh, discussion hangout to an end formally yeah. so that you can edit out this next bit so basically this will be the cut bit and this will be the bit just for yourself uh, so what i'm going to now do is invite the audience that is watching let's see if i can do this i'm going to show you the chat screen so that you can see the chat screen okay um, okay basically ladies and gentlemen of the audience you guys are the judge and jury for the purposes of this discussion what I want to do is see for, um, an acknowledgement uh, one way or the other. And what we're going to do is we're going to go with number one. If you think that um, the science teacher gave a good show and presented good evidence to support his assertions and was able to persuade you. So if you think the science teacher was good at pers persuading you about the science, I want to see a one. If you, think, if you think the science teacher sucked and didn't persuade you of anything, I want to see a nine. So it's either one or nine. One if you like the guy and he gave you a really good explanation or nine if you thought the guy sucked. 
So let's see what the response is. No, not too. It's going to be brutal. <laughs> yeah, it might be brutal. Yeah, not thanks too. for this. <laughs> we, we need to see either one or nine. So don't be putting in twos. Let's see what counts. Oh, no, let's have it on a scale. I'll be crushed otherwise. No, it's one or nine. So like, let's see. We're getting some nines in there. Quite a few nines. Eight and a half. Nine. Nine. Is there anybody that thought the science teacher presented evidence that persuaded them that the earth that we live on is a sphere? All right, so Olar H gave you a one. So he's on your side. So we've got nines, quite a few nines there. Actually, I'm not seeing any ones. Are you seeing this, sir? I'm seeing this. <laughs> what I'm going to say now, right, if, you, if you're up for this, and it's entirely if you're up for this, I'll do it because obviously the 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 uh, purpose of this was for me to come and try and prove to you, you know, that the, if you want to look at it that way, then the earth was at a globe. How about we do another one where you prove to me that the earth isn't round? No problem. I can do um, that, no problem. We'll do this again, and I'll set you some questions. Well, I'll tell you um, what, and then, I'll tell you what we'll do. Nathan and then the Oakley, is on you. Nathan Oakley, 1980s in chat now. If we're prepared, hey, Nathan, I like your show, by the way. I really enjoy listening to it. If you're prepared to do it on his show, what we can do is, between the two of us, I'm sure me and, I'm sure me and Nathan can present most of the best evidence that we've seen recently to prove that there is no axial rotation, curvature, gravity. We can prove the three essential ingredients of your world that you tell the kids that you, you teach to the kids that we live on may not actually be actually a spherical thing after all. If you're prepared to do it on Nathan's channel as a closed channel, me, you, Nathan, the three of us, because we need to, it's harder for us to produce the evidence for being flat when the whole body of science is in your favour. It's It won't be me and Nathan against you, but if you allow the two of us to work together to, to produce the evidence to try and persuade you that we might not live on a sphere, I think that's a good way forward because the preponderance of evidence is in your favour. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. Yeah. Right, so you, now, now you've say. got... So the only thing I say about if we're doing it on that because I'd I'd like to use you know a lot of this to put on my channel as well, um, and I know your work and you've been really really good with this, uh, like language wise and stuff. I um, I'd have to ask that we we didn't swear on it and then I could use it. And I know I know well, sometimes we can sort that out. We'll make it so that none of the none of the text goes through. That's fine. We can we can customize it so that doesn't happen. But you've got the point now where we can snap it, and I don't think I swore once, did I? No, you were brilliant. So basically, you basically snip out that adult bit at the end, and then you've got everything to present to your kids, and then we'll sort some out. So we'll do we'll do the Hoy Lake observation, um, and if anybody on the flat Earth side wants to come, um, feel free because th this is something that I've pushed for ages. Um, we can replicate it, and basically we'll bring some beer and we'll have a, we'll sit down in the summer in the evening, get some little chairs with us or whatever, and we'll just sit there and just drink, and we'll just capture the evidence, and you'll be like, oh my god, and when you see it real world you realise that these things are very, very small away, miles away, but very small. You have to zoom in an awful lot, and when you do zoom in, you get to see an awful lot more than what you ever expected could be possible by living on the fact that, by, or by realising that we don't live on a sphere. Um, so ultimately, like it's all there, we can sort it, and the weather's good at the minute, so it's good. Yeah, yeah, we're expecting a good summer. Right, I've enjoyed that. Cheers, pal, I really enjoyed it. You did crash and burn, though. Come on, you brought no evidence. I, I think, well, as like I said at the beginning... You know, for me to actually go, you know, to to sit in front of a camera and prove that the world is is round, um, that was always going to be impossible. I think, to me, the the strongest points I made, which I think are absolutely uh, nailed on, um, are the fact that the the independent experiments that calculated big G, that calculated R, that calculated M, you can you can individually look at those experiments and scrutinise them. But the fact is, when we take those numbers and we put them together, we do get the acceleration that we see. And that of all the numbers from naught to infinity, right, for it to land on exactly 9.8 when that's what we see, um, to me, you know, there is that's it. That is the proof. Well, just, we had to look just at by, that just by way of quick counter, when we know that the density of the object is more than the, the, the uh, density of the air around it, we know that it's going to displace it, right? It, we know that it will push the lighter stuff above it and it will displace that and go down, what you guys call down. Um, but ultimately... That happens on a flat plane as well. So that but doesn't why prove... why is it directional? It's not directional. This is Arwen's point. Arwen claims that it is down, but it isn't. We know that density is relative to itself. So it's like the pen in my hand has a value of density that we'll call one, and the air it sits in has a density of air that we call zero. And your question is, why does it go down? My, my answer to it, it isn't down. The pen doesn't know up or down. 
So basically, what your position has to be is that if this is going to be gravity that's causing the acceleration, the only way you could prove it would be to get an object of greater mass than the Earth, stick it above it, and then watch it go up. But it isn't up I... or down. It's relative to its density and, and the environment it's in. It's rel It's like that um, argument we've been having about perspective. How big's the pen? Well, the pen is like, I don't know, six inches. But then when you move the camera back and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it's not six inches anymore. It's six inches when you're orthographically looking at it side on, but it's relative to the observer. It's the same with gravity. It's relative to the environment that the thing's in because it doesn't know that it's going up or down. It just sees it as greater density than less density. But to prove that your point is down, you would need Jupiter to be able to manipulate that, and that can't be done. I mean, I think ultimately, like, the, the more dense objects travel towards if you don't want to say down the the land mass that is the earth then if i yeah. say that yeah the center of the then, earth then that makes it directional no it makes it relative to the center of the earth so directional because the center of the earth is in a position you know so it's 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 directional no it's relative to the center of the earth that's not directional it's only directional if you're in the third person looking at it but you're, if you're the pen it's not directional all you're doing is in your model go into the center of the earth now, yeah, you can describe it as down from the third person's perspective, but from the pen's perspective, it's being attracted to the, the attractive force, which in this case happens to be down. But if you went round to Australia, then it wouldn't be down to us anymore, would it? It would then be up. So, but then, so then you have to go round to relative to upside down, right? At, at the end of the day, the bottom line is this. Do you think that Australian people are upside down to us right now? Compared to us? Yeah. They're, they're orientated differently. Of course, they don't feel upside down, but yeah. And I just find that nonsense. But, you know, let's let's do it, man. Let's let's do the, the, the experiment, see what happens. And I, I know what will happen when we go back to Hoylake. I know what will happen when you get a gyroscope and stick it on your table for an hour at the beginning of class. I know what will right. happen at the end of the class. I know what won't happen. And I know what you'll explain, what you'll excuse for why it doesn't do it. But my assertion is that it should do it and you're going to have to make up nonsense to be able to show why it doesn't do it. And then I'll laugh at you and then we'll laugh about how I'm laughing at you and then we'll have a beer because it's not that big of a deal. But ultimately... Well, it's not, is it? We're not going to fall out. No, we're not going to fall out. But you have to understand that there is it is really contentious and people fall out with each other. I mean, it is really contentious. Only the, But, you know, it is what it is. We can only go so far, but ultimately... I, pfft, the onus is on science to prove that we live on a sphere because they're the ones that say we live on a sphere. All we've got to do as flat earthers is show that we don't. I would say the counter argument would be, and this is what I will be asking when we, we do it the other way around, the onus will be on you to disprove or to prove the conspiracy, if you like, um, you know, the web of lies we must all be being told. That, that will be what I'll be asking you. Well, I, 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 I don't subscribe. I argue that the Earth's flat, but I don't actually think that it is flat. I think that there's a, a fourth or a fifth dimension to what we live on. So, so I shouldn't have said... Yeah, I know, I, I know uh, you did. So I'm not going to try and prove that. that it's flat, but what I am going to prove is, is that it's not a sphere, that we're not spinning, and that gravity's bunkum. So I, I'll but be one, to... Like you set me five questions, I'll set you five. One of them will be, prove to me that, all, that there is this conspiracy that is, is there to lie to us. That'll be just to give you a heads up because that that will be but a real prove, proving yeah. a conspiracy to lie to us doesn't prove the shape of the earth. No, but for example, I mean, look at the, the questions here. Prove now distinguishing, like you said before, gravity from density doesn't necessarily prove the shape of the earth, but it is. It's a how can I put it? It's a very strong indicator. But if the if the pictures that the lying to us about are of a globe Earth, then if the lying to us about that. Well, then, there's, the, there's the proof, in my opinion, there's the proof of the conspiracy because you wouldn't have a rocket scientist from NASA with a biblical phrase on his on his grave that he didn't even believe in. That's like giving an Islamic guy pork, well, maybe not pork, but it's like giving an Islamic guy a Christian burial. A guy that worships NASA, worships science, worships, he would be the, that's the proof that there is a conspiracy because why does that exist? I don't know if you understand yeah. the magnitude of this. Um, I, I do. I do. This, I, is, I, well, this is the epitome of everything that that guy lived for, worked for, spent all of his working career on. It's the absolute opposite. I don't know why this document, this headstone would even exist if there wasn't a conspiracy of some kind. This guy shouldn't be doing it. Think about it. Whatever job your dad did, what did your dad do for a living? He was an ambulance man. Right, so an ambulance man, the antithesis of an ambulance man would be a daredevil, right? Because he's constantly putting his own life in his own hands by doing daredevil stunts, right? Your dad wouldn't like that kind of guy because he's going to keep scooping him up off the floor. 
So it would be the same as your dad putting on his headstone saying, I love evil can evil. Oh, I get it. Uh, but to me, I don't know, I've said to this over, over email, but like, to me, this quote says something different. It says, it's a quote about the wonder and the awe of what's what's above us, you know, in, in space, you know, and I think that's what he's alluding to. But again, that's subjective, isn't it? I think that's a preposterous interpretation, given that the words that are used are biblical. If what he was really saying was the way you say, magical and mystical, he should have said something non-biblical, and it should have said, the wonders of the universe were the, the or the greatest man's greatest achievement was landing Saturn V on the rocket or the moon or whatever it was that he did in that in relation to that because he would be marveling his own work, but what he's doing is the absolute opposite. So he's he's marveling evil can evil as a paramedic. You know, no paramedic would ever credit evil can evil, but that's what he's done, and I, that for me is the proof of a, that is that is the biggest tip of a cap to anything to do with science and NASA and anything like that that you could ever expect to see. That is, for me, the proof of a conspiracy. Right. Well, on that, mate, uh, the wife's going to kill me if I don't go down and spend some time with the kids, so I'm going to have to yeah, shoot Yeah, same for me. Listen, thanks very much for doing this. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I really, honestly, I really appreciated it. And uh, thanks. And, you know, I'd love to do stuff again. And we will do that ex investigation. Because I'm, 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 I can only be an hour away from you, maximum. What What town are you in? Uh, well, it's, it's near... Do you know Blackburn? Yeah. M M uh, M65. M65, yeah. So if you come off at Junction 5... Where the where the Mercedes dealership is? Uh, it's the Shadsworth Junction, Junction 5. There's not a big, uh, massive, industrial uh, commercial Mercedes dealership there? The, oh, God, there might be, mate, but I, uh, I don't know. It's definitely Junction 5, but if you come off and then take the turn that's opposite to Blackburn, the other one, I'm about 10 minutes that way. Oh, right, so you're going in towards Manchester rather than Blackburn? Yeah, but it's not near. It's not near. Man, it's more. It's more in between uh, Blackburn and Accrington. Fair enough. Well, I, I'm in Wigan, so Wigan's not that far away. Oh, I used to. I used to train down in uh, Goulburn actually years ago. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's not, anyway, that's another story. I will. Uh, yeah, I'll catch you on the time. But honestly, mate, thanks for that. I appreciate it. No worries. Have a good day, and thanks for the chat yeah, for too. the vote. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy the Saturday night. Bye, mate. You too. See you soon. Yeah. And thanks for the chat, guys. And I'm sure this will carry on at some point in the future because um, we're going to do something in the end. Um, I'm not going to open the chat up because my tea. Sorry, is how do I end up? No, it's all right. I'll sort it. Sorry. Right. See you. ta -ra. As you can tell, that my food's just arrived, and uh, I'm going to have to go and eat some food now. So have a good evening, have a good weekend, and I shall see you all soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye.